So while we just make sure everything's working, what, so what are you most passionate about right now, Rick? In the last couple of uh, months, what have you been working on? What gets you up in the morning? Yeah, literally most of today was finishing up the manuscript for the scientist in the early Roman Empire. Um, and the prequel to that, Science Education in the Early Roman Empire, came out um, last October. And the scientist is already available for pre-order on Amazon. It, it'll be out by end of year. So what's the basic, uh, what, what's that book going to be about? Uh, that is, um, well, the science education was about the education system, and it really covers the whole education system, all aspects of it, but uh, focusing on the science content of that, and uh, including even, like, pop culture, like, how did, like, illiterate people get exposed to any science content, and things like that. Uh, and so that covered all of that aspect of it, and then that was one chapter out of my dissertation in 2008, uh, at Columbia University. And the rest of the dissertation uh, is what I'm putting into the next book, which is The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire, which is a study of who these people were, what did people think of them, uh, what stories did they tell about them, what kind of uh, achievements did they make, were they aware that, of scientific progress, uh, and things like that. Um, so it's really kind of like a social history of science and scientists in the Roman Empire, and it has a whole canned history of ancient science. So it, it you you get exposed to the whole like what did they actually do all the way back to you know the pre-Socratics and Aristotle and stuff like that, uh, but it does focus on the the the, pit, the pinnacle of ancient science which was under the Romans. So this will be book number what for you? Uh, that one will be eight, my eighth book that I've authored myself. I've also put chapters in anthologies edited by other people. Which has been the most successful book for you so far? Uh, it's hard to measure that because the amount of all I see are the returns and royalties, right? Uh, I don't usually look at the actual number of sales because the amount of, it's hard to get that data. Like the, the, the numbers vary a lot and stuff because uh, there's digital copies, there's um, uh, audio copies. Um, every book that I've written uh, is available on Audible read by me. Uh, so, so people have full access to all my books on, on audio. Uh, and, and then, of course, digital formats. All Kindle, all, all of them are on Kindle. Some of them are on some other formats like Nook and things like that. Um, so anyway, there's lots of different ways the books sell. Uh, and so I, I look at returns in terms of royalties. I think on the historicity of Jesus, I'm, I, it might be my bestseller. Um, it, it's certainly selling way better than the publisher or any publisher expected it would do for, you know, a 700 page heavily footnoted, uh, dense scholarly monograph that really goes into these details. And um, it has 90 pages of apparatus, so there's like multiple indexes and bibliography and all of that. This is exactly the kind of book that no publisher would think that will ever sell. Uh, and I've sold uh, pretty chunky. <laughs> yeah, I've sold over. I mean, the returns I've gotten on that have basically approached ten thousand dollars already um, in two, three years of sales. So um, for an academic monograph like that, that's actually quite unusual. Um, and so. Really, it's though the my returns come from the combination of all my books. So I, I don't really look at one as more popular than the others. It's different people like different ones more. So, do you find that you're because of what you do professionally that you're a people either love you or hate you? Like, or is there a middle ground with <laughs> with you? There, no, it's lots of middle ground. Um, but there are certainly contingents of people who love me and contingents of people who hate me. Uh, and then there's people who, who are indifferent. <laughs> you, or some, there are even people who are a little bit of both. So, yeah. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you ever get, like, hate mail or stuff like that? Uh, I don't really so much anymore. Um, I used to get uh, the, Christ the usual Christian stuff. You're going to hell. We'll pray for you. That kind of stuff. Um, but that, I stopped getting that kind of mail, like, 10 years ago, really. Okay. Uh, and then the hate mail I got was the anti-feminists, like, you know, trying to convince me I shouldn't be a feminist and, or, you know, harassing me and doing things like that. But, um, but even that's died down now. So I don't really get, I haven't, I don't think I've gotten hate mail in a year. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> or very nearly anyway. You know, one question that I've never heard answered that I was curious about you was how many languages do you read or write or speak? Um, yeah, I don't, I only speak English. Um, and when, when you go through grad school, uh, in a language intensive field like mine, they have what's called translation competency courses for grad students, where they teach you how to translate the language, um, 
from a dictionary, basically, rather than trying to give you full fluency, because you need to know so many languages, it's just impossible to like become fluent with them all. So I have translation competency with multiple languages, uh, but it doesn't mean I, I need a dictionary. I can't just speak fluently uh, or hear it. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to find some time to spend you know a few months in an immersion class and really get my German or my French solid so I could converse in, in those languages. But I, I can skim articles in German and French and translate them um, uh, competently. And, uh, though, and also Latin and Greek, uh, ancient Greek. And with those languages together, I can kind of peck my way through Italian and Spanish uh, research articles. Like I can, I can look at a research article in Spanish or Italian and kind of figure out the gist of what the article's about, uh, even though I didn't like formally study those languages. Okay. So what do you know about me? Anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> Other than you have a great setup and you do, you, you run a really good interview. Okay. Uh, what I, it's sort of a hobby of mine. I, I basically um, do a couple things on my channel. I critique uh, apologists and, uh, and I hope a different way than most people do. And then I uh, conduct interviews with theists, men, mostly Christians, because uh, we're in the United States. And, um, and I d use the Socratic method. And basically, I just ask questions and I get to the root of why they believe, why they think they know what, what they believe is true. Yeah. Does that work? Do they, or do they get frustrated and leave? Like, how does uh, that turn out? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer that as honestly as I can. I would say that, <clears throat> I would say the 80-20 rule is pretty, pretty good there. I think 20% will be frustrated, uh, but I think 80% of the people I interview enjoy it. Um, and they ask to come on again and nice. Yeah. And, but I don't, I don't know if that's because they want a mulligan. Like they feel, Oh, <laughs> I, I should have said this to Doug <laughs> because oftentimes when I ask questions that get to the root and to the epistemology, they view it as a trap question sometimes. And, sure. so, and, oh, yeah. and um, but I, another question I was going to get, I, I have a, an interesting way to interview you tonight, but before we get to that, um, <laughs> Do you have one-on-one -on -one conversations about Jesus and religion, or is it you keep sort of that in your professional debates and, and so forth? Um, I, I do on occasion. I mean, I used to a lot. Um, you know, I I've, I've, have years and years of experience of doing that. Um, I just got tired of it because it got repetitive, uh, yeah. and so I prefer to direct my energies to doing things I think are more productive. Um, so I haven't, I don't do it very often anymore, but it still comes up occasionally. Uh, there's, I, so I travel the country, um, Canada, occasionally the UK. And sometimes when, like I, I stay at people's houses and stuff as I'm traveling. And sometimes the people who invite me to come and put me up are Christians. Uh, so um, there's, uh, there was this uh, Church of Christ group at a campus out in Indiana uh, that had me come out there. Um, and uh, and they were the, they were really you know college students but you know super religious but they were uh, really good hosts and were really easy to converse with even on topics you think would inflame someone right um, and uh, and and you know we're we're very uh, tolerant of discussing things outside their comfort zone and, and things like that so uh, so yeah I have I have those kinds of conversations but I, I usually now I don't like seek them out so if Christians want to have them it has to be like uh, first of all, it has to be downtime where you know I'm, I'm kicking back and we're just drinking and talking, which is fine. And then it has to be like you know polite, you know give and take kind of thing. Uh, so often I've, I've gotten in situations where they they get really hostile, like they're really intent on getting to a point that that you know is fallacious, <laughs> and you're trying to explain to them why it's fallacious, uh, and they keep trying to dodge that, and and that can get frustrating. Um, I had a conversation like that all oh, about a year ago uh, with someone, a Christian. Uh, fundamentalist who is really keen on uh, trying to argue that I should I should stick to the consensus in Jesus studies and never challenge the consensus uh, on the existence of Jesus, which is you know, I'm known for doing. Um, and that was a, a classic example of an argument that was going nowhere because he just wasn't listening uh, and, and wasn't paying attention to the fact that his his reasoning was not sound. And it was very difficult to like get him to see that. And that was even with multiple people trying to explain it to him. Uh, and so, yeah, I, so I do that occasionally, but it's, it's not something that I seek out very often anymore. Yeah. See, the, my theory is that I, I don't want to deconvert anyone, but I, 
I do think there's danger in someone being so certain about something. Yeah. That certainty breeds um, arrogance and, at worst, um, violence. And so yeah, and even if the person themselves don't go down that area, the fact that they're endorsing this way of being creates an atmosphere where you can have more people who are prone to violence or engaging in other forms of oppression, like political oppression. Um, you know, like that, we have this whole abortion rights issue going on in the country today where there's there's whole states in this country where it's almost impossible for a woman to get an abortion um, because of all the obstacles they're throwing up. Uh, and then you have, you know, bigotry and opposition to the trans people and to the gay community and things like that. So, yeah, I, I see this spills out. And, and, and whereas I would much rather the human race have installed in them a software update that sort of uh, reminds them that they shouldn't be so certain they should always self question because having that skill and that inclination to always question yourself and always say like, right, am I sure that I've got this right? How do I know? Um, that is a useful skill that applies to all aspects of life. And if you learn it, doing it on religion, it, it's possible for you to realize that maybe you should apply those same skills to other areas of your life. Not everybody learns that lesson. It's even you know, people who get out of religion and become an atheist and still don't apply those skills to other aspects of their life. But some people do, and and that's I think is making the world a better place if we can get them there. Yeah, like do you do you find that like when I ask people why do they believe what they believe, they will start listing some reasons, and I think I would say the majority of them, the evidence of the Bible is not the first couple things they mention. Yeah, and I'm starting to wonder, is it? just that they want to feel smart and not stupid for what they believe. And so then they go to the apologists, then they go to the historians and find the ones that agree with, you know, the position mm -hmm. they were raised with and say, yes, yeah, yeah. look, that guy's smart. He believes what I believe. <laughs> therefore I'm okay. Yeah. And, and so, um, once in a while I'll have some theists come on who will tell me, Doug, no, I believe because I am convinced by the propositions of the gospels. And, uh, and I'll, I'll take the, their word for it, but this is why I'm having you on tonight. Be <laughs> yeah. Because I think there's a lot of times they're not even aware of different lines of thought on, on these issues. So what, what I was thinking of doing, and you might hate this, and if you do, just let me know. <laughs> but <laughs> I, because I, there's probably not one question I could ask you haven't heard before, but I'm going to try to ask it in different in a different way, a different format, and that is true or false format. Mm -hmm. And I and I know you're a guy who loves probabilities. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it. It might be boring, but let's go. <laughs> uh, and yeah, no, the thing is, it will help go faster, and then also mm -hmm. it will. Um, if there's a certain one we want to talk about, we we have the freedom to do that. And and feel free to say mostly true or mostly false or yeah yeah you got to worry about false dichotomies yeah yeah, yeah. so I don't, I don't want to just you know put you in in those one or two boxes mm -hmm. but number one Judaism is the oldest religion true or false oh false yeah <laughs> super false uh, which is the oldest uh, we're not really sure um, you know you mean oldest religion that's still around. Right. Or oldest religion that ever was. Uh, those are two different questions. Let's say let's say that ever was. Oh well, no, yeah. So there are many religions. Uh, you know, the the Harappan culture long predates Judaism. E Egyptian religion long predates Judaism. Um, uh, you can go and, and China. I think we've got some uh, cultures there that predate uh, Judaism. Okay. So yeah, for sure, there are lots of uh, religions, I, and I think uh, probably the Chinese Chinese paganism um, it may be one of the oldest, still continuous uh, religious cultures on Earth. Uh, I, I haven't verified that statement; you'd have to go check. But it is very old. Zoroastrianism is also pretty old. I don't know; it's maybe about coterminous with Judaism, so they might be competitors. Uh, and there are still some practicing Zoroastrians in Iraq. Um, but uh, but yeah, you've got you've got cultures that go all the way back to you know we have actual religious texts that go back to 1700 BC before there even were a, a distinct Jewish people. Um, yeah, there's a lot so, of Christians yeah. that I talk to who still think that you know Judaism is the oldest religion. Uh, mm -hmm. Number two, Abraham was a real historical figure. The Abraham from um, the Old Testament. False. <laughs> Moses was a real historical figure. 
Also false. There are failed prophecies in the Old Testament. That's true. Can you name one off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch in uh, Ezekiel. Um, or, uh, oh, what's the one that's my favorite one? Uh, I, the one, the, the Tyre prophecy that, that Christians always claim is this great, amazing prophecy that turns oh, out yes. to be totally yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, I can't remember where that one is, but uh, but that's one of them. Uh, there's a bunch of those. Uh, also, one of my favorites is Jeremiah. Jeremiah pro prophesied that uh, essentially the end times would come and, and the Jewish people would rule the whole world. Everybody would be bowing down to Jerusalem. Within, and he named a number of years, and that didn't happen. Um, and so Daniel, the uh, people who forged the document of Daniel in the second century B.C., tried to reinterpret the prophecy. So, so they, they fake this story of where Daniel gets visited by an angel and this angel explains to him, it's like, oh, no, no, you got the numbers all wrong. Like you got to interpret the numbers a certain way. And if you do the numbers, you can get a different math and then you get a different result. So Daniel's trying to fix the failed prophecy in Jeremiah. But the funny thing is that Daniel's fix to that prophecy, which was supposed to bring on the end of the world and the victory of the Jews over the world and all of that stuff didn't happen either. So Daniel didn't, uh, Daniel's also a failed prof prophecy. So then, uh, Jews were constantly trying to reinterpret Daniel. And we have many examples in the Dead Sea Scrolls of them trying to like go back to the numbers and redo the numbers and try to find out like, well, well if the, he has to have been right. So uh, how do we get this? How do we convert this into a true prophecy? And one of the attempts to do that is Christianity. Christianity is actually spawned by these attempts by Jewish fringe cults to try and make Daniel not a failed prophecy. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's another one of my favorite ones. I, I have a whole talk online called uh, We're All Gonna Die um, <laughs> that uh, I did on Rapture Day uh, back a while. Uh, and you people can Google that, like, uh, we're all gonna die, Richard Carrier. Um, <laughs> and I, I talk about that, that whole story of how those prophecies kept failing and the attempts to fix those prophecies resulted in the invention of Christianity. One of my subscribers, and he better be a subscriber, his name is Viva Hernando One. He <laughs> asked... How do secular historians date the book of Daniel? Um, well, the way we date a lot of uh, fake prophecy in all religions, um, that one of the, and you can do this, like there's pagan oracles and things like that, where you can look at the evidence and you can see that. <clears throat> they, so Daniel, for example, is written as if it was written in 700 BC-ish. It was actually not, but it's written as if it was written then. And then, of course, it predicts history. And, of course, it gets a lot of history. It gets a lot of history wrong, but it, it gets the deep history wrong. So it clearly wasn't written by someone alive in the 700s or the 600s. Um, but right around the time where all the exciting events are happening, it turns out right when the book was written, it gets all the events pretty much correct up to a certain point, uh, which is about 165 AD, where we actually know the narrative of things that were happening in Judea at that time. And say, yeah, yeah, all this stuff lines up. And then immediately after 165, no, doesn't line up anymore, uh, which is a clue. It tells you that that's when they wrote the book. Uh, so because they could presciently use past history, recent history for them, turn it into prophecy and claim that it was prophesied you know, hundreds of years ago. But because they're not actually prophets, uh, they couldn't predict the future so that when they start failing to succeed at predicting the future, you know that's it was written before that date. So you can tell which date after it's written, which date before it was written. So it's generally secular scholars think uh, in the 160s BC. Okay. If if you can remember, um, what is one of the details that it starts to get wrong after 167 or 165? Yeah, the world didn't end. Um, but apart from that, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's supposed to be a great ruler who is supposed to come and kick everyone's ass, uh, basically, and make Judea the central empire of the world. Um, and that, that didn't happen. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, in fact, you know, uh, it was the prophecy was that you know it's supposed to be you know God's supposed to come and create this new paradise and this great uh, Michael the angel is supposed to come in and just be the great prince and defeat all of the Jews' enemies. Instead, what happened? The Romans came and conquered them. Um, apparently, that's all God lets foreign powers do is conquer the Jews. So, <laughs> so yeah. Okay, here's the next one. Um, and again, there's a. I'm, my guess is there's, there's going to be quite a few Christians watch this either right now live. We got 54 people watching or on the replay. So, and they might be hearing this for the first time. So question number, uh, I'll skip number five. Number six, Christianity is the first religion where a God dies and resurrects. Oh, that's definitely not true. That's false. Okay. Um, Osiris, Adonis, who else? Yeah, definitely Osiris. Um, 
uh, we have pyramid texts written in stone long predate Christianity that talk about his resurrection, uh, his death and resurrection. Um, but the oldest dying and rising God story is actually a woman. Uh, it's Inanna. We actually have the clay tablets uh, in from the Sumerian culture uh, dating to about 1700 BC, somewhere around there. Uh, actually excavated, so we we actually have provenance on those tablets. Uh, and they actually clearly describe Inanna uh, voluntarily going down into the underworld, uh, and she's stripped naked, and she's killed by a death spell, and her corpse is hung up on a stick, basically crucified in the in, in a one particular fashion. And then three days later, her minions come and feed her the food and water of life, and she's uh, raised back for, to life, and then she ascends to glory and stuff like that after that. And so we actually have that story in clay tablets. To It predates even Judaism, actually. Um not just Christianity, but there were many other dying and rising God myths as well that we can definitely place in pre-Christian sources. Okay. Uh, now let's move to the Gospels. Uh, true or false, the Gospels are historical biographies of Jesus. Oh, that's false. Number eight, the Gospels don't read as myth. Way false. <laughs> <laughs> this is one where I, I get from Christians a lot, Doug, just read the Gospels. They don't read as myth. And I'm thinking to myself, well... You know, people jumping or getting out of the graves when this Jesus guy died and, and walking around Jerusalem as zombies. That seems kind of mythical to me, or weird at least. Yeah, and it's not just that. Like, people focus on the defiances of nature, <clears throat> which there's way too many of them in the Gospels for the Gospels to even map as histories. Um, even in that period, histories were, were rational. There was rationalist history was the trend at the time. So if you were a historian at the time, you wouldn't just say, oh, these amazing things happened. You would say, oh, these people said this, but we're not sure that really happened. It might've been this other thing, or it might've been a story. You get uh, you get these alternative uh, sort of injection of critical thinking in histories of the time. Uh, the gospels are written completely gullibly as if nothing is questionable. Um, they never mention sources. They never say, so-and-so said this, this is how I know this and so on. So they don't act like histories at all. They don't act like biographies even. Um, so, uh, but the people focus on like the miracles defying nature, but there's a lot of other improbable events in the gospels. They're not like violations of the laws of physics, but are so unrealistic. They can't possibly have happened. Can you, can you uh, and like and a, an example. Yeah. Name the top three that a Christian listening right yeah. now would could look in the well, Bible well, for themselves and say, what? Right. The classic example is the beginning of the mission. Jesus walks up to these fishermen, speaks three sentences to them. They quit their jobs, leave their families and follow him with total loyalty. That, that's impossible. That would never happen in history. That's not how people get converted to a religion. That's not how someone decided to follow a particular leader. That's a completely fake story. And it's exactly the kind of way myths get written. This idea that he's so amazingly magnetic, he just walks up and goes, yes, I will drop my job and follow this guy. I don't even know what his gospel is, but we're going to do it. Um, that's not realistic at all. That's not how a history gets written. That's not how a real historical sequence of events would occur. Um, and, you know, there's others like, uh, even if you, you know, there's the withering of the fig tree, for example. Um, yeah, that's a miracle. So that's, that fits into the category of ridiculous things that can happen. But even if you assume that Jesus had the secret X-man power of withering fig trees, uh, in that story, Jesus withers the fig tree. He curses it to wither it for not bearing figs out of season. In other words, it wasn't even supposed to have figs. So he, and he knew that it wasn't supposed to have figs, but he cursed it anyway. Um, which makes no sense even for a superpower person. Uh, but it, it does make sense in context as an allegory where the fig tree is the Jewish temple cult. And the whole story is an allegory for why God allowed the Romans to destroy the Jewish temple cult. So reading it as myth, reading it as allegory, that's how myths get written, right? There are allegories to explain cer certain things, you know, when current I was, events or social systems. When then was, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense as history. When I was a Christian, you know what made my heart almost leap out of its chest when I read about Barabbas and thinking that can't, that that's weird. Why don't you tell uh, yeah. everybody what Barabbas is about? Yeah, that's true too. Um, so for those who don't know the story, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, and it gets repeated in some of the other Gospels, um, uh, so Jesus is hauled in and he's you know going to be crucified and Pilate doesn't want to crucify him for, for some reason. And, uh, and so he, go, he's, he goes to the Jews and says, well, okay, it's, it's the holiday, you know, the, the Passover is coming. Um, it's tradition for us to release one prisoner that you demand. And so he, you know, speaks to ask the crowd, 
<laughs> the crowd to harangue him and pick the person um, that they're going to release. And they, they all shout Barabbas, Barabbas, who was this insurrectionist, a rebel leader who had commit, mur committed murder uh, in the rebellion. Uh, and, uh, and, and he says, no, 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 wait, uh, like, don't you want to release Jesus? And they're like, no, 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 crucify him, give us Barabbas. And so he's like, all right, and he gives them Barabbas, re releases Barabbas um, and crucifies Jesus. Uh, this is massively unrealistic in so many ways. There was no such custom. There would never be such a custom. Pilate would never even follow that custom if there wasn't one. Um, and he certainly wouldn't let them let mobs pick a rebel leader who'd committed murder, you know, which means murdering Romans in, in an insurrectionist. Absolutely not would he let that go. Like he, he might let go some petty thief or something or um, someone who was, you know, uh, they didn't really have, care about uh, that much, but but no, there wasn't actually any such custom. Pilate would never have done that. Uh, but when you look at the story, it maps perfectly to a sort of uh, a myth about the Yom Kippur ceremony. So the author is trying to merge Yom Kippur with Passover, the two greatest Jewish holidays. Uh, Passover is victory over death, and the Yom Kippur is atonement for sins. And the Yom Kippur ceremony is that there's a goat that the priest will lay all the, they're twin goats, uh, they look identical. Priest lays all the sins of Israel on one goat and sets it free and then slaughters the other and it atones, for, its blood atones for the sins of, of the Israelites. Uh, and uh, Barabbas is very clearly the scapegoat. He's the one who's carrying the sins of the Jews, which is insurrection and murder. Um, and doesn't the, Barabbas, the, the name Barabbas mean? Um, Son of the father, yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in some manuscripts of Matthew, and we believe possibly that means originally in Mark, it might have gotten removed from Mark. Even uh, the Christian scholar, the third century Christian scholar, Origen, believed that there were manuscripts of Mark that must have said originally this, which is that they, his name was Jesus Barabbas. So his name was actually Jesus, son of the father. So you had Jesus, son of the father and Jesus, son of the father. So you had these, these twins, essentially these like lookalikes, uh, one of which carried the sins of Israel and the other was innocent and atoned and his blood uh, was shed to atone for the sins of Israel, exactly in conformity with the Yom Kippur concept. So this, this is myth. This is exactly how myths get written. This is the, exactly the structure throughout all cultures, throughout history. This is the way myths get written in this sort of allegorical uh, construct where these improbable things happen, but they're not trying to tell you a history. They're not trying to say these things happened. They're saying that this story represents a meaning. It's it's telling you something about the gospel. So to really understand it, you have to understand the meaning of the story. And that's actually explicitly explained in Mark. Uh, Mark 4, Mark has Jesus, after Jesus tells his first parable, goes away with the disciples and says, yeah, yeah, I told this story, uh, but that's all false. Uh, don't take the story literally. It's it's an allegory for something, and I'll tell you in private what the secret allegory is. But but other people will think that it's literally true, and then they won't understand, and therefore they won't be saved. The subplot to that meaning that only people who join, who actually become initiates in the religion, and are told the real meaning of the stories, only they will be able to be saved because only they will know the real meaning of the story, which is not the literal meaning of the story. So all of Jesus's parables are not meant to be taken literally, but people were taking them literally. Uh, they're meant to be read allegorically. And Mark is doing this. I think this is a big clue. He's telling the reader, this is how you should be reading my whole gospel. Uh, the whole gospel is like this. Do not take it literally. These are parables. This is an extended parable about Jesus. It's a parable about the gospel. If you, you won't understand the gospel if you don't understand the real meaning of these stories. And the real meaning of these stories is not that they happened. Um, and, and that's certainly how Mark writes. Uh, as you get subsequent gospel authors, they start to try and force the historical truth of it more and more and more as you get further on uh matthew a little bit more luke a little bit more john is totally really trying to stick it in your face like, oh this really happened all oh, this really happened um but that's not how mark was writing so i hear time and time again that doug the gospels are eyewitness accounts true or false oh false yeah the gospels are four independent accounts i always hear that true or false oh very false yeah even John is not independent of the synoptics. Uh, all the leading experts on Johannine studies have said so. Um, I have a bibliography on that in my book on the history of the city of Jesus for people who don't think so. Uh, no, we have extensive evidence that John, even John knew the synoptics. The only thing John did differently is that he didn't, well, like sometimes he borrowed words from them verbatim, but most of the time he did not. He rewrote them in his own words, which is actually how schools taught you to use stories is to rewrite them in your own words. The idea of just stealing the text literally and changing a few things um, was kind of uncouth. That wasn't normally how a good literary artist would work with material. Um, 
it's more like a way of trying to sell your version of the text as the original version of the text. So it's more dishonest to do that, do it that way than the way John did, which is just rewrite the story the way he wanted and paraphrase it in his own way. Um, that's a skill that was actually taught in the schools that he would have gone to to learn the Greek that he writes, um, whoever this guy was. Uh, actually, we, we know the Gospel of John we have now was written by multiple authors over time. It, it's been edited. Uh, so there's actually more than one author uh, of John. Even the Gospel of John itself says that it had more than one author, um, but, but it's even worse than, than it confesses to because it's been reorganized, things have been pulled out and added in. Uh, so there's illogical sequences of events and stuff like that that uh, clearly were not in the original version. So the version we have has been re-edited over time. So it's actually, it's not just one dude, it's, it's several dudes. How, how um, well, let me ask you this. I, I get often that, Doug, there were eyewitnesses alive at the time that could have said, voiced their concerns if there was anything in the Gospels that were in error. What do you say to those people? Um, well, first of all, even if it were true, how would we get to hear what they said? Uh, if the, if, you know, first of all, if they just spoke it out loud, it wouldn't get written down. Secondly, if they wrote it, Who's going to preserve the text? Only medieval Christians for a thousand years decided what texts that they would copy out and keep. Um, so there may have been tons of written texts that were rejected and, and, and not preserved. We have a classic example of the Gospel of Peter, uh, which is a, clearly a forgery. Uh, we don't have it. We have pieces of it uh, that survived from some her heretics on the fringes of Christianity, preserved pieces of it. Uh, but uh, but the whole gospel itself was destroyed because Christian bishops went around and said, hey, this is we don't like this text. We don't like what this text says. We need to get rid of this. And so they actively sought them down and got rid of them. Um, so that, so they're, sometimes they're even actively getting rid of stuff. But even if you're not actively trying to destroy literature, they're making conscious decisions which literature to copy at all. Uh, so we know there are a lot more books available about uh, different Christian perspectives in the fourth century uh, that didn't survive the Middle Ages simply because medieval monks chose not to preserve them. They didn't copy them out. They just, you know, once they rotted, they threw them away. They didn't keep them. Uh, so, so, the, so the first problem with that is that even if there were people challenging the Gospels, we don't get to hear them. Um, we only get to hear challenges uh, from the other side. So, for example, um, uh, all, the, all the criticisms of Christianity that were written that we know about were all destroyed. The Christians didn't preserve any of them. But the answers to them, the apologetic rebuttals to them, sometimes survive. So we, we, we can see, uh, try to figure out what the original critic was saying through the lens of the polemics of the person arguing against them. Uh, but one of these is in the Bible itself, uh, the letter of 2 Peter. Um, it's mainstream consensus. We're quite certain 2 Peter is a forgery. Uh, whoever wrote 2 Peter did not write 1 Peter. The style is completely different. Uh, so it's some other author, so it's clearly not Peter. Uh, so someone faked that uh, and pretended to be Peter and wrote it. But what it has in there, it's an attack on these other Christians. It doesn't name them. It says there are these other Christians who are accusing the Gospels stories of basically being these cleverly devised myths. And then to answer them, this forger pretending to be Peter says, no, it's not a cleverly devised myth. I was actually there. I met Jesus on the Mount and so on. And he tells the story. Now that's fate. That's false. Uh, right. So the author of it is not the dude who was there, even if there was anyone there. Uh, so they're inventing this myth of historicity to attack these other Christians that we otherwise know nothing else about. We don't get to hear what they said. We don't get to read their books uh, who were challenging the gospels as histories, as histories. They were saying the gospels were myths. They're saying the gospels were allegories for things. Uh, and we have hints in Irenaeus later where he talks about these other her heretics he's attacking who also treat the gospels as allegories for these cosmic events and stuff like that. So we know there were these gainsayers, but we don't get to hear what they said. Uh, they, so that's the first problem. Yeah, and they could have been, uh, could have been dead as well, right? <laughs> that's the second problem. Yeah. Uh, the gospel, so, so people have this assumption, we live in a modern Western society where lifespans, the average life expectancy is weirdly high. And people have forgotten that that didn't used to be the case. Uh, right now, average life expectancy is in the 80s. Um, so you can expect someone to live to 80. And everybody, like, like people are shocked when someone dies before the age of 80, like, oh, uh, but that to live to 80 back in the Roman period was extremely unusual. Um, uh, many people did like uh, you can actually do the actuarial data and, and map out how many people survived uh, to that age. It's like maybe one out of 200 or something like that. Uh, but no, the average life expectancy, you could if you survive childhood, you could expect a 50 percent chance you'd be dead by the age of 48. Uh, so better than 50 percent. So more likely than not, you'd be dead before you were 50. Now, if you think the gospel events, the events, the, the time in which the gospel events would have happened would be the 30s AD, 
if you were you weren't a kid then you were an adult you'd be let's say 20 uh you've got maybe 28 30 more years left uh on average before you'd be dead and now, now that puts you right in the jewish war the gospels written after that and conveniently conspicuously the gospels were being written 40 years plus after the events in question which is exactly the period of time when witnesses would be dying off or would be already dead. In fact, the majority of witnesses would be dead by the time Mark was even putting pen to paper. Definitely the vast majority would have been dead by the time Luke was putting pen to paper. And it's different when you're talking about when you're making a story up because it's not like there are witnesses who knew Jesus and said, no, no, that's not what he said or did. If the guy never existed, it's going to be extremely hard to find someone who can verify that he didn't exist. You can't interview everybody in Judea. You could talk to someone in Judea and say, oh, I, okay, I was in Galilee. I didn't hear that, but I'm, I can't be everywhere in Galilee. I don't know. So it wouldn't be possible to actually have witnesses gainsaying these things, except things that are so extraordinarily famous that they should have been gainsaid. And the classic example is uh, the, the sun going out for three hours, um, where we know for a fact had that happened, tons of people would have reported it. We, like There were tons of astronomers, there were tons of historians. It would have been widely reported. So here we have an example of something that definitely didn't happen. We know it didn't happen. It was made up in the gospel, but no one gave a shit to gainsay it and say, like, oh, that didn't happen. And Or if they did, we don't get to hear them. Their stuff wasn't preserved. So um, so yeah, so you have the, the people dying off problem. You have the problem of the original writers don't even necessarily believe what they're writing. So I don't think Mark for example, was actually thought that what he was writing down was history. I thought he's he was writing a myth, he was writing allegory to symbolize the message, the gospel, and create the sort of collection of stories that missionaries could use to sort of answer critics and stuff as they were going around spreading the gospel. Um, so, so there would have been Christians in this period who didn't care that the gospels weren't true. They were using the gospels in a different way. They were using it like Jesus is portrayed and telling them to use it in Mark 4, saying like, the literal version of the story is not really true, but that's what you tell the outsiders. Insiders get to hear the real story. And so you had this oral lore, this sort of internal oral lore, these secrets would be told amongst the Christians themselves, where it's not literal. Uh, and so gradually over time, as you get decades and decades on, you get these Christians who really want to push these stories as literally true. But as you see the time goes on, the more decades pass, more witnesses are dead. So there's fewer people who can gainsay you. And that's exactly when it starts getting pushed more historically when no one can gainsay you. So uh, uh, so that's super suspicious, uh, that whole sequence of events and chronology. Um, so those, those are the principal problems with that. Uh, but also, of course, the Gospels themselves don't say that they're using eyewitness sources. Um, Luke actually denies it. And people often say in Luke 1, he says he's using eyewitness sources. Like, no, actually... He says he's using written sources, and he's asserting that those written sources were using information passed on by eyewitnesses, but he doesn't say he himself spoke to any eyewitnesses or was using any eyewitnesses, and he doesn't name anyone. Even He doesn't even name the written text he's using, uh, much less uh, do, um, the eyewitness sources. So, do, do Christian historians, your peers in the biz, do they, yeah. agree, do they agree with you on that point about the gospels are not written by eyewitnesses don't name their sources do they do yeah they uh, admit that certainly the non-fundamentalists um there are a lot of fundamentalist christians who have the phds and whatnot um and i i have to really regard them as as kind of a, a population of con men uh so that's uh, like uh, so th they will say things and maybe even uh, Conmen's probably too unpolite because some of them are actually under the gun on this. Uh, there's a lot of history of them being fired or punished for even daring to suggest that anything in the gospel is not literally true. Um, we have a huge list of these uh, scholars recently in the last 20 years, these fundamentalists who have been pushed out or fired or investigated or you know put under pressure just for slightly uh, trying to side with the mainstream consensus. The mainstream consensus would be non-fundamentalist scholars who aren't obligated by their religion or even sign statements contracts with their universities to never deny the literal truth of the bible uh and you're not a real scholar if you've signed one of those documents to say that you will never you will never reject the literal truth of the bible um you are not a scholar anymore you're, you're a dogmatist uh you're a shill for a for an ideology uh you would no longer have academic freedom that that's an illusion i, I don't you know if you want to i don't know if you want to answer this question but do has it ever happened that after a debate the uh, someone who's more on the fundamental side when it's just you and him or her off to the side 
you get a different impression that they agree with you more than they let on in public? Has that ever happened? No, that has never happened. Um, there, I won't name names, but there are two, two kinds of Christian apologists that I run into in debates. The actual con men. Uh, and when I interact with them privately, I can smell snake oil. Like I, I know, like they won't say it, but I know they know that they're lying a lot, that they're deceiving the public. Um, and then there's the ones who genuinely believe what they're saying and can actually be legitimately surprised when I bring up things that they didn't know. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and, and those are like, kind of like almost the saddest ones to encounter. Um, but yeah, th those are the two kinds I've run into. I've never had a, an apologist kind of hint that it's all, it's all a game or whatever. Like, uh, I've never, never had that kind of, you know, I, I, I rewatched the debate, uh, recently of you and William Lane Craig, and I got this sense that he was surprised by some of the things you were saying and he wasn't aware of it. Do you think that's true? <laughs> You know, that's a good question. Um, I actually, uh, one of my girlfriends has skills at uh, mapping debates, um, flowing a debate and scoring it professionally because she used to do uh, for many years debate in college. And I've been meaning to, I keep forgetting, <laughs> been meaning to tell her to, to actually do a professional flow of the, the Carrier Craig debate because when I left that debate, I felt like the, he'd made a bunch of arguments that I, the clock ran out and I just didn't have time to rebut all of his arguments. So I felt like I'd technically lost because I couldn't answer all his arguments. But other people have pointed out that I made a bunch of arguments that he never answered in the debate. So now I'm not sure. Uh, so I, I'd like to have someone professionally score the debate and see like how many arguments did he drop um, versus how many did I, was I forced to drop for lack of time because the clock ended. Um, so, so I didn't notice what you're talking about because uh, I was trying to deal with the, the responses that he, he – because he was shotgunning vast numbers of claims, um, pulling stuff out of his ass even sometimes uh, that I had to re reply to. Uh, so I, I didn't – I wasn't focusing on that aspect of it. So I'm curious to, to hear about that, what you're saying, that you thought that there were some things that he was surprised by. Um, he certainly read some of my work, but I find a lot of these apologists don't really read my stuff. Um, when I debated Craig Evans on the historicity of Jesus recently at Kennesaw, it was very clear in the debate that he did not read my book at all, even though it's the latest peer-reviewed literature on the subject in his field. He was completely blindsided. He had no idea of what was in my book, and, th and I, which I summarized in the debate, and he didn't know how to respond to it. Uh, so I find this happens a lot, that apologists are not even bothering to read my stuff. Um, and they just view it as kind of like a game to try and get around, like, oh, okay, he must be making that up. Uh, but we in reality have vast lists of sources and scholarship and peer-reviewed literature that back me up on every little thing. Um, so that happens a lot. I, and it's, I think that's weird and I don't quite understand how to explain it. I would think like, if you really believe in this, you would want to like really read closely the literature challenging it and see how it holds up. Um, that's how I approach things that challenge my views. So do I you, look at the think, past um, cases against it. Do you think Michael Lacona was surprised by anything you said, or did, did he? Does he know yeah. your point of view? Yeah. Um, well, Lacona, though, I, I didn't have writings for him. I didn't have a lot of writings for him to know, and I think he was familiar with the stuff I'd written uh, when we debated. We debated twice, uh, Michael Lacona and I, um, and and he handled those debates fairly well. I think I. Those are both technical wins for me. Uh, if anyone scores those debates, they usually score out for on my side. Um, but uh, but yeah, he, he was surprised. He was surprised even by things that he he wasn't surprised by. Uh, to give you an example, um, he did he was surprised that I studied for the debate, and meaning that I watched his other debates, so that I knew what he, what he was going to argue and how he was going to argue. So I was came prepared, and I think that surprised him. Uh, and one of the things that when I, I watched him, I watched the Lacona Barker debate. And that was the most useful one to watch. Uh, I watched a few others, but uh, that was the key one. And in that, one of the questions that Lacona asks is he challenges Barker's like, what are your qualifications in ancient Greek? Um, and this is a common thing in apologetics is they want to try and challenge credentials. Credentials are so much more important than facts. Uh, so, um, so he challenges him on that, and, and he, had, he had his own answer. But um, So I said, oh, that's an interesting question. I'm going to prepare a slide for that. Uh, and so I went to the debate, waited for him to ask that question, and it came up. 
uh, in cross examination, and he said, you know, what are your qualifications in Greek? And I said, slide whatever, please. And then, you know, my wife at the time brought up the slide, and then the audience by this point is laughing because every damn thing he said, I had a slide number for, uh, and they was like, how the hell does he know what I'm going to ask? <laughs> He's already got a built slide, and so I have the slide with you know detailing my entire graduate history and undergraduate history in, in ancient Greek, which is way more extensive than his. Um, so that was kind of a smackdown, and he was really blindsided by that. Uh, and so that's an example where he even he knew I would have an answer for that. He knew I had a PhD or was getting a PhD in uh, in um, the field. So uh, so he he knew I was going to have an answer, but I think he was not expecting a fully prepared, detailed slide with extensive qualifications that really made him look not like the most qualified person on the debate. Um, I yeah, wanna, but, I, wanna... but I find Lacona to be a fairly honest guy, though. He's he's one of those ones I think who really believes what he's selling. Yeah, he. Uh, I thought that would that debate went very well, and and you guys seem to genuinely like each other. Uh, I you know what bothers me though is, and I'm guilty of this. I've uh, I've said at times the majority of historians say X, and Christians say uh, many yeah. times, and we really don't know what the majority of historians say, do we? <laughs> Yeah, it's complicated by a lot of things because when someone says that, even if they're telling the truth, which is already, that's a step, um, but even if they're, what they're saying is true, all they can really mean is all the historians who've written specifically on that subject, which is by no means even, you know, like a, not even a majority of all historians, it's going to be a tiny fraction. Um, an example is, is John. Like, so the idea of John's dependence on the synoptics. There are a lot of historians who have opinions on that subject, but most of the historians who have opinions on that subject have not read the authoritative expert literature of these scholars who all they do, like their primary thing is they're experts in John, right? So there's a lot of these, you know, bigwigs who've built whole careers studying John. And so usually in the field, that's what you look for. You're like, who's, who's specialized in this or spent, or one of their specialties is this. They've written peer-reviewed literature on this. They thoroughly studied it. What conclusion did they come to? And then you look at the majority of them, and then you get a, you get a feel for like, all right, that's probably what the consensus is. But you don't really know because you're not, you're not polling all the other historians. But even if you did poll all the other historians, the poll might be useless because all those other historians might not have read this specialist literature. Their opinions are just half-assed. Uh, based on their own like uninformed, barely informed uh, view. So, so that in fact, even if you did poll historians, that actually would not be useful data. You want to poll the historians who've actually examined the evidence extensively. So you actually want to look at the experts on that topic. What do they say rather than just poll the whole field? Okay, I wanna, um, yeah. And what Christians yeah. often do is they just, they just look at, oh, well, all the apologists I like say this, and therefore that must be what all historians agree is true. Uh, and that's not the way history works. Go ahead, Cam. Yeah, yeah it, it seems that often um, historians in an area that they're not an expert on, they will hold the position that they received during their undergraduate degrees. Mm -hmm. Like, what was the received yes. view during the time? <laughs> that is so true. Um, so, yeah, to, to their detriment, uh, or even disaster sometimes. Um, it's a particular problem because to get specialized skill in biblical studies, most people only do that by studying under Christian apologists or fundamentalists, um, even if they become agnostics later. And so the field is rife with these Christian ideological assumptions that are keep being packaged and sold as scholarly opinions and conclusions when in fact they're not. Um, and one of these examples I had uh, when I debated uh, Mark Goodacre, uh, who is a liberal Christian uh, scholar, really good scholar, like I think one of the best in the field. Um, I debated him on London radio. It was a polite, you know, uh, debate. It was a London uh, Christian radio station. Um, and I have a blog. People can find this on my blog and read up on it and, and, and find the link to the original thing so you can listen to it and stuff. But, um, but he argued this. We're, we're debating the historicity of Jesus. And he argued that um, Paul says, he, it's written in his epistles, that he says he got the, he learned the gospel from those who were in Christ before him. And I said, no, that's, that's, that sentence is nowhere in the epistles of Paul. In fact, in Galatians 1, he says exactly the opposite. And not only does it say exactly the opposite, he swears, literally swears, uh, that that's not how he learned the gospel. And, and so it's, it's the exact opposite is the case. And Mark Goodacre says, no, 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 there's absolutely that sentence that's in there. Like, he says he learned the gospel from those who were in Christ before him. And I was like, no, no. 
I totally looked. Trust me, it's not there. So we went to commercial break, and so we're looking and looking, and 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 he had to admit, like, shit, that fucking verse isn't in there. Um, why did I think it was? And the answer is, is like you were told that in your undergraduate studies. Uh, so there's this, this, there are lies like this that get told and, and these scholars just assume this is true. It must be true. I went to a prestigious university and these prestigious professors told me this was true. Um, they didn't think to check, uh, to actually look and see what does Paul actually say? Does he ever actually say that? Where does he say that? Um, so that's an example where I think the, these false facts get into even secular scholars, even liberal scholars believe them and repeat them because they didn't check. Uh, and and so th th this is a big problem in Jesus studies. It's worse than any other field of history, I think, because there is so much of a backbone of the field is built on Christian apologetics rather than objective scholarship. Um, and, and that's not the only example I could give many others, but that that's a, a, an example of what I mean as a problem with what you were talking about, Cam, uh, that I think is a big problem in trying to decide what the consensus is based solely on what you were told once. Cam wants to talk to you about Bayesian and your and your view of Jesus. But before that, I, I'm I want you to give me your best guess of what if there's a hundred historians worldwide, just mm. for sake of argument, an even number hundred, how many of the hundred would agree with Habernas's, you know, the minimal facts thing that uh, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea, Jesus' tomb was found empty, people experienced mm. post-resurrection, and number four, that there was post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Um, um, no, I did one twice, but I think you're... Yeah, you're, I know exactly what you mean, though, yeah. How many he started them, with... How many of yeah. them would... What is your guess, based on your your peers, the people you interact with, including the fundamentalists, the secular, the, lib mm. the liberal, how many would answer in the affirmative that those are four facts? So I, I don't think in that term because I, I do not accept fundamentalist opinions as valid. So I don't count them. Um, so if, if someone were to say, what would be out of 100 historians, I say, I'm not going to count fundamentalists. I'm going to answer your question for 100 historians who aren't uh, biblically, religiously, and contractually obligated to deny the facts. Um, so, uh, so I would be talking about liberal scholars, non-fundamentalist Christians, Jewish scholars, secular scholars. Out of them, uh, how many would believe uh, those four facts? Um, and I would say probably... Well, and then there's also like, what would they admit to um, publicly versus what do they really think privately? Uh, this is a problem with historicity. I actually know there are more historians um, who um, who are skeptical or agnostic about the historicity of Jesus than will admit it publicly. Uh, so, uh, so there's there's two different answers there. It's like, what do I think the reality is versus what do I think would be a report if we were to take a poll? Uh, so I think the crucifixion is the one that, that would be correct, that Habermas would be right about, that uh, at least 90% of non-fundamentalist scholars agree that, that Jesus was crucified. Wow. Um, so I, and that's that's what I suspect anyway. Um, and, and that's just, you know, a, a, a rough estimate based on what I've seen. And, and I think they're misinformed, and I think they're they're repeating things as, as these assumptions that they've not examined. But that's a whole other thing. And, I, and really, the the first true peer reviewed challenge to that conclusion only came out in 2014, and most of them, if not all of them, have not even read it. So, uh, what percentage? So that, so that, that. What percentage of historians get, are fundamentalists in your estimation? Uh, I'm guessing in biblical studies, I would guess probably two thirds. Um, there are actually some estimates of numbers uh, in David Fitzgerald. He just came out with a three volume set, um, Jesus Mything in Action. Uh, in one of those volumes, I think volume one, but you can check to find out. But one of them, he actually got a team together and actually went to universities for all of these where these degrees are awarded. Um, so yeah, and figured out like, do, you, do were they uh, are the faculty mandated? Do they contractually obligated to be lit biblical literalists and so on? Um, and so we actually got some data on the schools that are producing these scholars. And I think it came to like two thirds of them have faculty that are bound by contract to not question uh, their religion, uh, not question literal Bible and all of that stuff. Two thirds uh, of biblical studies programs in the United States. That's that's a high percentage. And so if the if the number of scholars matches that, which I think actually be higher because probably those schools are generating more biblical scholars than schools that aren't like that because fundamentalists love to do this stuff. Um, 
So it might be more than two thirds are fundamentalists. So these are people who have uh, signed. These are people who have signed confessions of faith. That uh, well, the faculty they would have studied under did, um, and if they are now faculty at these same schools, then yes, they have as well. Um, also, if they are members of certain societies, so like uh, there's the um, Evangelical Philosophical Society, also required for it to be a member, you have to actually sign a faith statement. So that you basically write, sign away your academic freedom just to be a member of that society. William Lane Craig, incidentally, is a noted member of that society. So, uh, so there are there are society. Even if you're not a faculty member somewhere, you might be a member of society, a society that requires this, or you may be a member of a church community that's going to really pounce on you if you deviate. And so, um, even if you don't have a contract, you might have pressures on you anyway. So yeah, I think the percentage is really high. I don't think the number of secular experts in biblical studies. Is, and Jewish scholars, by the way, count them, and liberal Christian scholars is as high as people would hope it would be. Um, but to get back to your, your minimal facts, uh, so empty tomb uh, is the other one. Uh, I, I show even, I show some of the, the math, mathematical uh, lying that Habermas does. He plays tricks with numbers. Uh, I have a blog article on that, on uh, innumeracy, a fault to fix, and people can look there and see even when you look at what the completely scientifically illegitimate method that he uses to try and argue that 80% or 75%, it keeps going down. It was 80, then it was 75, now it's 67% of scholars believe in the empty tomb. His method is completely incapable of reaching that conclusion. But more to the point, when you look at his own numbers, you can determine that actually his own numbers indicate that fewer than a third uh, believe in an empty tomb. Um, once you include agnostics and deniers, right? So, so that that minimal fact is out, uh, and and I think you, you're starting to see more and more like Lacona and stuff admitting that, and not they're dropping that minimal fact now, admitting that the majority of scholars do not believe in the empty tomb. Uh, so, so a lot of Christians who cite that at you are citing old Habermas stuff. So even Habermas and Lacona and other apologists have given up on that one already. So the new, the new apologetics is admitting that there's no, there's not a majority of scholars agreeing with that. And then you I get the appearance, you get the appearance. Yeah, right. Then you get the appearance one. And that's, that's an example of con game uh, where Habermas will say, well, the majority of scholars agree that they had experiences that convinced them that Jesus was risen. And then he immediately jumps to, therefore, they had these, they met Jesus and touched his wounds and all of this stuff. No, no, you're confusing two different things, conflating two different things. Uh, the majority of scholars, certainly the vast majority, if not all, uh, non-fundamentalist scholars, both liberal Christian and um, Jewish and secular scholars in, in this field, would tell you that, yes, we think they had experiences, but we we would not say that they were anything outside of the realm of scientific possibility, in terms, like hallucinations, dreams, uh, personal feelings, things like that. Um, they would not say that the narratives of handling the resurrected body of Jesus and hanging out and dining with him for days on end that are depicted in the Gospels, they would not say that those stories were true. Um, and so Habermas plays word games where he tries to, to say that, oh, yeah, they admit something happened. Oh, and what they admit happened was this stuff that's in the Gospels. I'm like, no. If you were to say, like, the stuff that happens in the Gospels, almost all non-fundamental scholars would say, no, that, that didn't. We do not think that happened. Uh, so, how does, so how does that play into the two thirds thing? So, uh, do you are you saying that as historians they say that based on the evidence we can't justify these minimal facts, say the empty tomb, mm -hmm. but as you know believers in Christ we believe it? Is that what you're saying? That's what liberal scholars do, um, and and they have a variety of ways of, of getting from A to B on that. Uh, some. Uh, fundamentalist is the wrong word. Some, I'll say conservative scholars. Some conservative scholars also do that, but very few, um, because fundamentalists are usually biblical literalists, so they can't do that. Um, but in, a famous example of, of a scholar who was a conservative Christian believer, but he was Catholic, not, not a fundamentalist, he wasn't a biblical literalist, uh, is Raymond Brown. So he's deceased now, but he's, he was one of the most renowned biblical scholars of the late 20th century. Uh, wrote some famous books on the, the, the birth narratives of Jesus and the crucifixion and resurrection narratives of Jesus. And is he um, the guy who um, talks about the virgin birth and says that on historical grounds he can't support it, but yet on faith grounds he is exactly. That's exactly what I was going to point out. Is that he actually explicitly makes that distinction where he says, "No, on, on just objective historical methodology, we cannot prove these things happened, but I believe it as an article of faith." Uh, and as a Catholic, I believe it on faith. Um, and and he, he would probably, if you were to sit him down and argue like, well, how did, why? 
he would probably say, well, I have these fe feelings and experiences. I feel like God's talking to me or whatever. Like that, that I have this feeling that it, it really is true, but I totally understand that I can't prove it with historical evidence. I can only prove it with this sort of psychological believing that I have a channel to God kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. So the, I think this leads in quite well to um, questions around methodology and how it is that we can assess claims about history and what yeah. type of evidence we use to um, conclude that they're either, either true or false. Yeah. Um, so in um, your research on the historicity of Jesus, you published the book Proving History, which assesses method um, and you know what methods we should use as historians to assess claims. And obviously, uh, Bayes' theorem is a central part of that. So I've got some questions around Bayes' theorem that I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on. Yeah. So how, how do uh, prior probability is this really important concept in Bayes' theorem? And I've heard some um, various Christian folks asking the question, how can we actually assess the prior probability of a specific claim? So let's take an example. Um, the claim that uh, Caesar crossed the Rubicon River um, in northern Italy. H how do we assess the prior probability of that claim before considering what evidence that we have to support it? Yeah, exactly. Um, what I like to point out when I get to ask these kinds of questions by people who are really struggling with it is that I point out that you're already doing that. Right. They, they already do. Every time they make a conclusion or assumption about something, they're already making assumptions about the priors. In fact, you cannot reach a conclusion about what probably happened in the past without making some assumption about the prior probability. You might not be aware that you're making that assumption, but you have to. It's actually logically necessarily the case that you are assuming something about the priors. Um, and so the question is, are you are your assumptions well founded or not? Like, and, and you won't know that if you don't even know how to examine your assumptions. So how do you get at what you're assuming is the case? And uh, and for things like that, uh, I like to talk about like why like you want to get away from the area of bias because bias is going to strongly skew their priors. Their estimates of priors are going to be hugely based on biases rather than data. Uh, but if you can get away from that, you can teach them how they're already in their life constantly all the time. Uh, making assumptions about priors and what what data they're basing those priors on, uh, and so if you get away from Christianity, you can talk about other things like other miraculous claims, ridiculous claims that they would definitely say are false the moment they heard them before you even discuss the evidence for it. Um, and then you would ask them like, why do you? Okay, we haven't, I haven't even shown you the evidence for this ridiculous claim. Why did you just immediately reject it? And they'll they'll probably pre pretty good at like give you a list of like, well, that's not how the world works. We've got vast amounts of data and science about and history and stuff. We know how things work and things like that. That's not how it works. And you say, well, okay, that's what you're doing. You're looking at the data of what usually happens when you hear a claim like that and investigate it. Uh, how often does it turn out to be bogus? How often does it not get vindicated by reliable evidence? you're already making those assumptions that the data plays out that way. And people are usually actually not bad at estimating priors. They, they, they can sometimes overestimate or underestimate them depending on the extremes. This is actually a, a known cognitive bias when the probabilities get close to the high or low ends of the probability range, either zero or 100%. Uh, when the probabilities get close to those ends, the human brain is really bad at uh, getting getting in that range. We, 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 if you're getting towards 100%, you, you tend to like underestimate probability. If you're getting towards 0%, you tend to overestimate probability. And um, con artists, stock market geniuses, and insurance salesmen really exploit this failure in your brain <laughs> a lot. <Right. laughs> um, but uh, so you have to figure out a way to get around that. There are skills, critical thinking skills you can use to like prevent that failure but but even but apart from that common mistake people are usually pretty good at estimating priors based on past cases as long as they don't have a bias that's intervening and screwing up the reasoning uh, and so that's why like Christians will, will readily recognize a ridiculous story and tell the difference between one that's plausible versus one that's not um, and when you say something yeah when, when you hear a, a standard political military event like a, a general crossed a river uh, to change the course of history they say well most of the time when I hear claims like that they turn out to be true uh, and so that's that's a that's a prior probability estimate. They're saying so like, so oh, to get in, clear, you know, to get to get clear here, you're yeah. you're not saying we should ask the question, what is the probability that like in in the history of the universe that 
somebody would cross a river named Correct. Caesar. It's, yeah, yeah. it's the question, um, how often do claims like this turn out to be true in history? Yeah, absolutely. Prior probabilities, and, and this is how your brain already is doing this uh, innately, but even when you're doing it like rigorously and correctly, um, prior probabilities are based on reference classes. So you want to pick a reference class that is the most informative reference class that you have. So you, you want to have a lot of data in that reference class, and it has to most be most resemble the, the one incident that you're talking about. So like military generals crossing, story, we say stories about claims about military generals crossing rivers and changing the course of history, or, or, or you wouldn't even have to be that specific. You could be like uh, of military actions um, in history. Aggressive you, you, that's, military that's right. actions. So like, yeah, it doesn't have to be crossing a river specifically, but those kinds of mundane activities. It doesn't, so the claim, for example, is not Julius Caesar crossed a river of lava, right? It's he crossed a river. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, that's the kind of thing that generals can do. Like, there's nothing that's going to prevent that. And that's a plausible story already. Now, if he, you know, he waded it through a river of lava, now you've, you're in a different reference class, right? right. Um, you're, now you're looking, you're comparing it to a different set of stories that turn out to be false most of the time. But if and you have, so, like, just general yeah. standard military political history stuff, those tend to turn out to be true. Not always. So your prior is not 100%, but it is going to be high. Um, and so you're already starting with a high prior. Um, and then if you're, if you're not comfortable with the prior, like, say you, you think it's 80%, but that's still a one in four or a one in five chance of being wrong, right? So, um, you know, well, okay, then let's look at the evidence and, and see if we can get that probability up increase it from 80 percent or if kind of the evidence lowers it and maybe the evidence is shitty and, and suggests he didn't cross the river come but you know that's when evidence comes in and that's when it changes and what we call update your priors with the introduction of evidence so in in the case of the gospels and applying this concept to the literature we find there we see a claim made like that uh, Jesus divided uh, bread and fish to feed the multitudes. Now, how how would we assess the prior probability of that? But more importantly, what type of evidence would we need to have in your methodology to conclude that that was true? Right. Um, now, for those who are interested or in this, is it possible? Uh, it is, but it's exceedingly difficult and probably requires counterfactual history, um, mean, meaning that history had to have turned out differently than it did. Because <laughs> there's a difference between um, how you could prove a miraculous event happened had if miraculous if miracles were really a thing, but then the whole world would be different. We would have a whole different array of background evidence by now. But the fact that we don't is exactly why we don't believe miracle tales. So there's also a counterfactual reality that, that, that we could prove miracles existed if miracles really existed because the world would be different and the evidence that we have that we're working on would be different than the evidence we have. Um, so uh, that's, but we're not, we're in a different world. We're in a world where miracle stories turn out almost all the time. Well, actually all the time they're investigated, they turn out to be false or unprovable. Um, that's the world we're in. And so that's the evidence we have to work from. That's the background knowledge we're working from. And that, that constrains our options in a way that would not have been constrained had miracles been common and, and a common reality that we'd be studying right now. So, um, we, so we would say that this claim about the dividing of the lows, this would fall into the same reference class of all the other claims that mm -hmm. are, you know, things that we've never really observed before that have been made in history. Yeah. So there's, so we got to realize that this is a story in a book written by someone who doesn't even cite sources. And, and it's a book that has a lot of material around it that looks very allegorical and even explicitly has Jesus explaining that the stories he's telling are allegorical and so on. So, so we have a lot of context that really narrows down our reference class in a way. But let's take another a different example. There are gurus in India today that perform magic tricks like the multiplying loaves and things and do other like a supposedly amazing things. Um, and there are actual irrational, there have been rationalist societies and skeptics and stuff who actually investigate them and expose their, their tricks in India. Um, and sometimes they get assassinated actually for doing this. Uh, so the gurus are not exactly an ethical bunch. Um, but uh, when you have this background, you, so when you, if you were to hear about this, you'd hear, that, oh, this guru actually multiplied loaves and fishes. Um, 
you would say immediately just based on the backstory, all the reference class information we have regarding the nature of science, the nature of the previous investigations of these gurus and the fact that there are no such abilities anywhere else and, and so on, you could say that probably most of the time it's some magic trick. Uh, there, it's prestidigitation. They're, they're pulling something off. That They're not really multiplying loaves and fishes. Right. And so the, the impl and so the implication there is someone says, oh, well, maybe we could explain the stories of Jesus by saying that these were all tricks and stuff like that. And that's called the rationalist trend. It was popular in the 19th century. The problem with that is that we're not, those are not commensurate situations. It's not that, uh, like we're hearing, like we hear stories of actual gurus doing these things. So it's a thing happening contemporaneously. It's, it's a thing actually happening that we have reports of. That's not what we have for Jesus. We do not have any eyewitness or anyone who has any credible association with any eyewitnesses reporting that Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes. What we have are these mythographers telling a tale about Jesus multiplying loaves and fishes. And that is a completely different reference class. In that reference class, when you look at these stories, like you have stories about Dionysus, you have stories about Osiris, you have stories about these other magicians and wizards and uh, holy men and uh, demigods and stuff who do other similar amazing miracles like this. So you know, um, Hercules and the Algean stables, and you have all these other tales where these things happen. Those, the majority, vast majority of those cases are not, they do not have a rational core as if it's a, something that's been, it was a trick that was misreported or whatever. No, the vast majority of the stories were just full on made up. Um, and and we're, we're comfortable with admitting that. Like we, yeah. there was no real, Hercules figured out a way to clean the stables quickly um, and then got embellished into this. He flooded the stables somehow and miraculously uh, emptied all the poop uh, from the stables. But of Augeus, but no, no, we, we, we know like the story was just made up. Like that's most of these stories, the 99 point whatever percent of them are just made up. And so that's your prior right there. Like when you look at a story in the gospels of something peculiar happening and you go, all right, 99.9 .9 whatever percent of the time, it's just made up. So that's your prior. That's bad uh, for the historicity of the event. That's different, however, from the historicity of Jesus. The Gospels could be 100% yeah. fiction, and that will have no effect. It might have no effect on the prior probability of Jesus. Um, yeah, so that's, that's so a different secular, thing altogether. Yeah, secular historians proposing, you know, historical Jesuses, they're not really claiming that he did miracles, so... It's expected either way. So to get on to that, actually, it's a good transition. Um, in your book on the history, historicity of Jesus, you compare two hypotheses. You're looking at the hypothesis of minimal mythicism and the hypothesis of minimal history. And um, for anybody who hasn't read the book, um, the a general outline of the minimal historicity thesis in as presented in your book is that Jesus was a man with followers who continued to follow him after his death. Um, some of these followers believed that he was executed by Jewish or Roman authorities and that he subsequently became worshipped by these followers as a demigod or god or celestial figure. So a question, and you compare that against your minimal um, mythicism thesis, which has like uh, about seven seven propositions. Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide that minimal historicity thesis, and how did you deal with the um, the challenge that as you limit the um, propositions in mm -hmm. scope, you reduce the ability for the theory to explain, say, data in the Gospels and and maybe some ah. specific data and Paul and, and mm -hmm. that type of thing. Yeah, um, it's important to note that when you're doing Bayesian analysis, you're using Bayesian logic, that background evidence affects all the probabilities. Every single probability in the equation is conditioned on background evidence. So that affects a lot of the stuff. Uh, so for example, if you're, to, if you're a proponent of minimal, myth, uh, minimal historicity, um, you can be totally comfortable with the Gospels being 100% fiction because that's actually the kind of thing that happens to obscure historical figures that get mythologized later. Um, so, you, so there's not an incompatibility between the Gospels being totally fiction and Jesus being a historical person. Um, so that uh, it's not that you need the minimal historicity thesis to explain the creation of fiction about him decades later, your background evidence already makes that likely uh, once you've got the religion going. 
right? So, right. so uh, I'm actually- and you have examples. We have Holly Selassie. I use an example I actually use in the book um, uh, where, where that, that's not an unexpected outcome mm. uh, at all. So you don't even need the theory to predict that to happen. You kind of just know statistically it's going to happen. Um, so th so that's, that's, why, that's how you solve that particular problem. So I, I'm actually thinking about it the other way around, where by limiting the scope of the thesis, don't, doesn't that mean that you um, you lose out on some data that can be better explained by a historicity thesis? So the, the objection here or the question mm -hmm. here is, say if we um, take Ehrman's uh, thesis of like an ap apocalyptic prophet or something like that, that obviously has a lot of content around what this Jesus figure would be te teaching. And so you could plausibly, and you know, of course you'll dispute this, but you could plausibly use um, evidence from the gospels to support that, th that theory. Yeah. You know, the argument would be that um, Jesus being an apocalyptic prophet would make this data in the gospels yeah. more expected than say minimal mythicism. And that's what they do with all of them. So the zealot hypothesis does exactly the same thing. And these are contradictory hypotheses. Um, you have the Jesus the magician hypothesis. You have the Jesus the cynic hypothesis. You have, uh, you know, the, all of these different versions uh, of, of Jesus do the same thing where they cherry pick evidence and say, well, this theory explains these pieces of the gospels. Now, immediately the first problem there, and this is the problem I point, point out early on in proving history, is that, that that methodology makes all historical Jesuses plausible, which makes none of them plausible. Right. Um, because so like if, 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 it, if it makes uh, all these contradictory versions of history equally likely, you're, you've, you're screwed yourself over. <laughs> you, you haven't gotten any closer to the truth. You, you clearly, your method is not working. Um, so there, there's advantages and disadvantages to complexifying a theory. So. Uh, I take minimal historicity. My goal is to say, like, I'm going to make it as easy as possible to prove historicity by not adding propositions that, if questioned, would make that version of historicity unlikely. So if you were to do, like, the apocalyptic prophet, and let's say someone comes along and gives evidence against that hypothesis, um, you've just reduced the probability of the apocalyptic prophet. But if you take apocalyptic prophet out and just stick with the, the rest of the stuff, the, the probability goes up because you don't have all that evidence against apocalyptic profit stuff. Right. Um, so that's the advantage of make, keeping it minimal. Now, if you think by adding details that you can actually increase the probability, which is exactly what should happen if we had good evidence for historicity, uh, you should be able to narrow things down. And you could do this with Holly Selassie, for example. You could have a, a theory of the true history of Holly Selassie, um, which is the, 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 uh, Rastafari was his, you know, the, the holy name assigned to him by the Rastafarians because they believed he was the, the Christ figure and so on. Even though Haile Selassie himself denied this. But anyway, they wrote these gospels about him that he didn't endorse. <laughs> that are uh, So, so that you, you can explain pieces of those gospels as having core truths to Haile Selassie and others being embellished stuff that was added later. But the reason we can do that is we have good data that we can actually really well establish the historicity of Haile Selassie and we can establish which things are true about him and which things are not so we can actually see in the Gospels which things the truth explains and which things the religious fiction explains. Right. Um, so you can actually build out a really good theory of the historicity of Haile Selassie that makes a really good explanation of the content of the, the Gospels of Rastafarians. Um, we should be able to do that with Jesus, uh, but we can't. Um, and there's two, right. only two ways to explain why we can't do that with Jesus. One is that he wasn't historical, and the other is that so much evidence has been destroyed and distorted that we're just screwed, um, that we just can't do what we can do with Haile Selassie. And so there, we just really should just admit that we don't know a lot of things, rather than just assert certainty about what we think Jesus was or did. Right. Um, and, and I think that... And this is this gets back to cognitive biases. Another cognitive bias that's very common is this uh, ambiguity and tolerance. People are very uncomfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. They don't like the idea of saying we don't know. That like physically hurts them in the brain, uh, and so they feel much better if they can be certain about something. So they like things that give them certainty. And I think even like secular scholars like Bart Ehrman feel like physically, mentally feel much more comfortable being certain about their theory of the historical Jesus, because it would be very disturbing and uncomfortable to admit that they don't actually know that what they're saying is even true, that there's not enough evidence to even know that. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, it's so just, that's the thing I think that that's a hard cognitive bias to overcome, and it is a problem for everyone. And and historians, being regular human beings, are also prone to that problem as well. Yeah. So, um, in the book, um, you list out some elements. These are like background facts that mm -hmm. effectively historians should agree on, and that they're important um, yeah. to assessing. Um, the the later evidence that comes in your book and some of those things are disputed um i remember back um you i think you had a debate with trent horn I yeah think it was yeah, yeah. and he, he tried to really dig into um things like the uh, the life of adam and the, the claim about adam being buried in heaven yeah. um, the ascension of isaiah and the the claims of the redaction of that gospel mm -hmm. um, to include, you know, whether or not we can actually yeah. conclude that the part that was redacted was, um, oh, sorry, that was included was not originally mm -hmm. in the text. Now, um, what is the level of consensus in in the field on on these background elements? Yeah, for the ascension of Isaiah, um, all the actual specialist experts in the ascension of Isaiah agree with me, and I cite them for that reason. Um, there are a few things we disagree on um, in terms of what, what we think in terms of the order and why these things got inserted and stuff. Um, but that's a case where the evidence is plain so that you can actually, you don't have to be an expert to see that they're going against the evidence. Um, and so that, that's a case where I think even they really need to update their opinion on those things. Uh, but what Trent Horn was talking about, uh, Trent Horn was basically just going against the mainstream consensus of the experts who are specialists on the ascension of Isaiah. And this is a problem that I find in general where uh, Christian apologists, and Trent Horn is a Catholic, Catholic apologist, uh, they don't like the opinions and conclusions of the expert specialists on a subject so that they want to try and debunk them or come up with excuses to reject them. Uh, and I think that's the opposite of how you should be doing scholarship. If you're going to reject a consensus of specialist experts, you need really good evidence to present and say, like, this is this is exactly where you can see their conclusion is going against the evidence and it's plain to see. Well, and um, ideally, and, ideally, you would write and publish uh, correct peer reviewed uh, papers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, which still, so far, I'm the only one to have done this. Uh, 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 my book uh, on the historicity of Jesus is the only peer-reviewed study, either article or book, uh, that's been published by a peer-reviewed academic biblical studies press um, on the question specifically, the historicity of Jesus, that's been published in almost 100 years. Uh, so there's a desperate need for a peer-reviewed study promoting the historicity of Jesus. No one's done that uh, since 1923. Um so it needs to be done desperately uh, yeah. and even uh, trent horn and i in that debate like in the end we we're both agreeing like yeah someone needs to do this we really want and i really want one of these books because i want i want the best damn defense the best damn peer-reviewed defense of historicity so that i can tell someone yeah read my book read their book and then you've got all the data you need to make a call uh instead of these sort of non-peer-reviewed pop market stuff that that's terrible and is not helping uh mm -hmm. really so um and, and, and Horn agrees. He also wants that. He, he, he could not bring himself to cite any of the books that were promoting historicity because they weren't peer-reviewed and he didn't like them. He had, has methodological issues with them just as I do. Um, but uh, but yeah, we both, we both agree on that. We both want a really damn good peer-reviewed defense of historicity to come out and no one's done it yet. Um, so yeah. yeah, when I talk with uh, Christians, uh, one of the other common things that gets claimed is that there is good um, attestation for Jesus outside of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if we limit our view to just the New Testament documents, which is what we've been talking about so far, yeah. um, there's, you know, obviously you could claim maybe bias because they're faith literature or something like that. But the Holy Grail would be really solid attestation for Jesus mm -hmm. outside of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And two, um, two of the most prominent examples of that that people point to are two sections of Josephus's works and, mm -hmm. um, and Tacitus. Now, are those good attestations for Jesus? Are they reliable? No, they're terrible. Uh, they're the worst things we would want. 
Um, and I've written about this multiple times. Uh, everybody tries to say like, well, if we have at least as good evidence uh, for X as you do for Jesus and you believe X, so we should believe Jesus. Uh, and th they've tried so many people. They've tried Spartacus. They've tried Julius Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, Alexander the Great, um, Ty uh, Pontius Pilate, uh, Herod and Typus. Um, and so they keep naming, oh, like if, if you used your same method on those guys, we'd have to doubt their existence. And the conclusion is, no, we wouldn't. Um, even first off, they, they don't fit in the reference class. So, so you know, resurrected, worshipped savior gods tend to not exist. So the prior probability is already against Jesus. So you, you need better evidence for Jesus than you do for these other guys. But the fact is, we have way better evidence for these other guys um, than we have for Jesus. If we had the evidence for Jesus that we had for these other people, um, if this wouldn't be an issue. Socrates is one of the big examples. And I talk about Socrates. I have a whole section on him in On the Historicity of Jesus, where I point out the evidence that we have that establishes the historicity of Socrates is really damn good. Um, you can have better evidence, but it's still pretty good. And if we had the evidence for Jesus that we have for Socrates, this would be a no-brainer. I would be totally defending historicity. You know, I'd be saying, like, yeah, look at this. The evidence is good enough to say he existed. Uh, but the thing is that we don't have that evidence. Um, and these these references in Josephus and Tacitus that come, you know, 60, 80 years later, uh, even in the best case scenario, uh, and the best case scenario is definitely not true, but even in the best case scenario, at best, all we can establish is that they're just repeating what Christians were telling them based on the Gospels, that we can't establish that they're independent uh, sources. So, for example, Tacitus doesn't say, oh, I checked the records, the government records of executions and confirmed that there was this guy and so on. He doesn't say that, right? So what he says is basically just the stuff that Christians were telling him. Uh, and that's not, we can't use that to corroborate that what they were telling him is true. All we can use that for is that that's what they were telling him so that that story was extant at that time. It doesn't help us determine if that story is true. And that's even if you can establish that Tacitus actually wrote that and there's actually a really good case to be made that Tacitus didn't write that. Um, You've got a peer-reviewed article on it. Exactly, right, uh, which is in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, uh, and, and I do like that article. You asked me earlier which articles I like in that, and I like all the peer-reviewed articles in that. <laughs> my, my article on Hitler is my favorite one, but but all the ones that I, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of, the one on Thalus and the one on uh, Josephus and the one on uh, Tacitus. Um, so so it sounds like there's not great attestation for Jesus outside of the Bible. The, the, no. the next thing that people will point to, and in fact, I mean, really build their case on, is the evidence with the Bible, but in, specifically in the epistles. Yeah. Now, um, Paul would be our earliest author um, mentioning Jesus and, or mentioning Christ Jesus, um, mm -hmm. and he writes within, say, like 14 to 30 years after his death. Is that right? Yeah, that's fair. I think all his letters probably written in the 50s um, or close enough to. Uh, so we're talking, yeah, maybe 15 to 20 years after the fact, up to 30 years after the fact. Yeah. Well, just quick question. Did Paul exist? Uh, yeah, I think statistically probably he did. I have an article on my blog for people who are interested in that as to why I think we can defend the historicity of Paul, but not Jesus. Um, and it's a good example of like, first of all, Paul does not fit in the reference class that Jesus does. And secondly, we have the kind of evidence for Paul uh, that we don't have for Jesus. The evidence for Paul we have is not great. It's just his letters. But if we had actual credible writings of Jesus, that would actually be pretty good evidence that he existed. You would have to actually have evidence that those letters were forgeries. Mm -hmm. which we do have for some of the letters of Paul, but and there are some scholars who try to argue they're all forgeries. Um, I don't find those arguments convincing. Right. Okay. So but, Paul but probably at least having Paul... the writings of the dude, that's evidence that the dude existed. Yeah. Uh, and there's other reasons to believe that too. Um, the writings of, uh, so once, so if some of the letters in the, uh, uh, written, supposedly written by Paul that are in the new Testament, the mainstream scholarship consensus is that they are forgeries. So we exclude some of those, but there are about six or seven letters that, that, Pretty much everybody agrees are authentic letters of Paul. Now, the experts on those letters, the specialists who are expert on those letters, uh, most of them agree that those letters have not been transmitted to us the way they were originally written. They actually look like pastiches of multiple other letters, and that that's problematic for a number of reasons. It means they've been edited over time. We're missing stuff. 
Uh, we're missing yeah, whole letters. Speak. Paul refers to letters he wrote that we don't have. So, um, so it's it is a distorted lens that we're looking at. But it's still, I think, when you look at those letters, they are clearly written before the Jewish War, which is exactly when uh, all our information places Paul. Um, and so, for people who want to say that Paul, that our history about Paul is all wrong, the one group that I think has the best argument are the ones who argue that Paul lived actually BC rather than AD. Um, now I don't oh, think wow. that's, I don't think that's the case, but um, there, there, for example, there's a reference to Aratos uh, as a, as a ruler of Anabatea um, having agents controlling Damascus. Now that's really hard to fit with Roman history. There's only like one or two years in which that could have happened. And we don't even have a very clear certainty that it did happen. Um, and that's usually the, the, all the dating of Paul is anchored on that. However, mm -hmm. if you put Paul about 100 years earlier, there was another Aratas who did control Damascus very clearly then, where it would be no difficulty establishing that. And so when you relook at the letters of Paul, there's nothing in the letters of Paul that's, that actually really securely dates it to AD rather than BC. Um, so I, that argument I at least wow. find plausible. Wow, that. That argument so I find plausible, but I, I don't, I'm not convinced by it. I, I still think... The, the Paul writing in the 50s fits all the evidence best. Um, right. But, uh, yeah, so if you're going to, like, you know, start jiggering with history, there there are some interesting details that, to play with there. Would that uh, fit in yeah. at all with the claim that Jesus was actually a figure in history in B.C.? Yes, and that's kind of why that's an intriguing hypothesis. Uh, because there were the Christians outside the Roman Empire, the Christians who were preaching in Babylon and in the Persian and Parth Parthian Empire. Um, those Christians, according to the, the Jews who are arguing against them, at least the only Christians that those Jews knew about, uh, as we know from the Talmud, the only Christians they knew about were preaching a Jesus who died in, about in the 70s BC, uh, uh, not under the Romans. Uh, so they had a completely different myth uh, that placed Jesus in a completely different time. Uh, and then you could put Paul in the, like the 60s BC and and, and the, the evidence will line up quite nicely. Not so well that it argues that that's the case, but it, it would fit. In any right. Case. Um, it's a little bit unexpected. Yeah. Um, so, so you have that uh, and that would be interesting. And there have been some historians who've tried to argue that the real Jesus was the one who was executed after Janias in the, you know, the 70s BC and then the, the updating the myth putting it under the Romans under Pilate was, was the new revamped Christianity uh, that really Christianity had been around a lot longer than that. Um, I'm not convinced by it, but uh, it's at least worth examining. I mean, I'd, I would, I would hear someone out if they had like a really methodologically good case for it right now. I don't see the, enough evidence to know, to really establish that it's the case. We would need some new find, uh, you know, discover some new lost scroll or something that, that wasn't forged and, all the new discoveries tend to be forged these days. Um, yeah. Uh, but so uh, on, only, on current evidence, really, we can't yeah. get there, yeah. So, so I'm going to try to, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some stuff out there from Paul. Well, and uh, Hang on, we got to, it, it's been an hour and a half, Rick, so I know it's been flying I'm good by. to go for, you want to go two, you wanted to go two, two hours? I'm yeah, good I, to I just want to make sure that's fine with you. And yeah. um, maybe. Absolutely, I'm cool with that. Maybe Cam, let's stop um, maybe five or ten to the hour and try to get a few questions in from the fans. Yeah, sure thing. I I think mm -hmm. that this next bit will will be over fairly shortly. I, I don't <laughs> think it will take too long. But um, but I, I've got to try to challenge you. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm I would say that I'm agnostic about Jesus's history. Well, I, I want to interject though that that. Arguing from the letters of Paul is exactly what defenders of historicity need to be doing. Yeah, because because that is exactly where the where the, on a, like a plausible debate exists. All the other evidence is terrible and just it, it's just shameful that they're pushing it. Uh, you would say really that the other evidence, uh, but was when you're expected about, either way, exactly. There, there's stuff in Paul that is peculiar uh, that you can use to try and argue for historicity. It's unfortunately so peculiar that it's not the best argument you can have for historicity. But we're going to get into that. But but it's still at least legitimate debate and and that's where and i show that in the book where some of my estimates my a fortiori estimates in the book are actually in favor of historicity from the epistles um so so i do so, and, and that's not what i think but i think that's as far as you can really argue with it so, uh, so yeah i think there's a legitimate debate to be had here about this 
So just some terminology there. A fortiori can be thought of as like a, a best case estimate for the hypothesis of history. Yeah. It's, it's like most in favor of the historic. Correct. Hypothesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So you hear this claimed um, by you. You hear it come up in debates about the historicity of Jesus. Rick, um, the, the evidence is clear. Jesus was born a Jew as attested in Galatians, lived under Jewish law as attested in Galatians, was from the house of David, Romans. Mm. Jesus had brothers. One of his brothers was James. He had 12 disciples. He was poor and he was a servant who acted with humility. Does this sound like a does this sound like a mythical Jesus or does, or sorry, a celestial Jesus, or does this sound like an earthly Jesus? What, what's your, what's your response? <laughs> uh, well, half of that fits both, right? So actually, um, Jesus wasn't a servant, right? He wasn't a slave or anything like that. Uh, so we, we, we know right out of the gate that that's not a literally true statement. And yet it's said, uh, and so uh, that means you know right out of the gate that what they're saying about Jesus is allegorical and not literal. So that's a clue right there that you can't take these statements too literally. Um, what does that actually mean? In fact, um, when, when they say, when Paul says in Philippians 2 that Jesus became a slave, um, that actually echoes what he's talking about in Galatians. Galatians 4, which you mentioned, like, born under the law. Um, it doesn't say he lived under the law, incidentally. That's, that's, that's an interesting way to phrase it because that's a classic example of how people will take a a thing that's in Paul and then uh, change a word and suddenly it's become a different, completely different statement right. than what Paul makes. Because like, it would be totally different if Paul had said that Jesus in life had lived under Jewish law. That would actually be a good statement for historicity. But that's exactly, that's not what he says. And that's why it's so frustrating. So uh, this would be the gnomenos um, versus gnao? Yeah. Well, this, I can't remember the exact terminology. Right. It's, it's born or made, but that's a whole different debate. But we're talking about the difference between being born under the law versus living under the law. Ah, oh, right. These would yeah. be very different statements. If, if Paul had said that Jesus had lived under the Jewish law, that would entail that like some sort of actual interaction with the political environment, which would anchor Jesus into earth history in a way that, that none of the statements of Paul actually do. Um, so, so that would be a much better statement. I would love to hear, if, if we had a letter of Paul that said that, that would actually greatly increase the probability of historicity. Uh, no, what he says, he was born under the law, but the whole argument in that Galatians 4 is that what he means is that he was subject to the judgments of God in terms of this, it really, Paul is talking about a cosmic law, this sort of thing that governs everything below the sphere of heaven. And heaven. You know, Paul talks about it, uh, this idea of like, this sort of this cosmic force that we're under, that we need Jesus to escape, right? There's this, this sort of the, the, the pressure of God's law uh, that you can never satisfy. You can never meet this to get atonement and therefore be saved. And that Jesus is sacrifice. If you attach yourself to that, you can escape it. And so for Paul, this idea of being under the law is this, is this cosmic metaphysical reality for people. Uh, and that's very clear. You get that in Romans 8, Romans 7, uh, and in Galatians 4, when you read it all through what he's talking about, he even says, like, he's talking about an allegory. He's not talking about literal women. He's talking about people you're born to. He's talking about this sort of cosmic status that you're born into. Uh, and then you want to exchange this status for another status, a better status. You want to not be born of the uh, the woman who, who enslaves you to the law. You want to be born of the celestial woman who frees you from the law. And you know, he goes on and talks about all that. But so when, when Philippians 2 talks about Jesus becoming a slave, what Paul's saying is that he became a slave to the elements, to the to the laws of nature, to the laws of God and stuff. He submitted completely. He was he, he renounced all the supernatural powers. And that's explicitly in Philippians 2, where he says he did not uh, he 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 rejected the opportunity to be equal to God and became a slave instead. And, and Paul talks about being a slave to the elements, uh, which, which are like demonic forces uh, that he's talking about. So he's talking about like, like fully submitting to the natural order, uh, which would fit either the minimal mythicism or the minimal historicity because it would fit a historical man uh, that people were trying to gin up as this descended deity. It would also fit um, this cosmic deity who descends just like Osiris did below the moon and becomes subject to the natural order and is subject all the way to death, allowing himself to die. Uh, and assuming a body, that's the other thing is, uh, so there's the debate over, yes, absolutely, Paul believes that his body was flesh, 
uh, it, briefly, in any case, uh, long enough to die. Uh, body was flesh, it was Jewish, uh, and it came from Davidic seed because prophecy required that it do so. Uh, the Messiah had to have a body made out of the seed of David. And so the minimal mythicist hypothesis is that that's God literally made a body of flesh uh, for Jesus out of the seed of David in the same way that he made it one for Adam out of the dirt of paradise, right? So, um, so it fits both. Uh, and so you just have to look at the context of, is there any context in here that, that really anchors this on earth or is this still allegory? Is it still sort of the celestial mythology? Um, and I think it's largely 50, 50 for, for most of these. Um, uh, and, and, and that, again, that that's where the debate has to be. You have to actually look at, let's look at all the full context of this. And that's why I have a whole chapter on that in on the history of the city of Jesus, whole sections on, what does he mean by brothers? What does he mean by seed of David? What does he mean by born of a woman and all of that? Um, at, at best, I think it's ambiguous. And when you say like you're an agnostic, I think that's a, like a completely respectable place to be on this where you, you see both sides of this. And, yeah, they, they both fit. I don't know where to go on this. Um, uh, Raphael Lataster came to the same conclusion in his book uh, where he analyzes, compares my case in, on the historicity of Jesus with the case uh, in uh, Bart Ehrman and the case with Maurice Casey. Um, so his book, uh, you can look up uh, uh, Raphael Lataster's book on um, examining the history of City of Jesus, uh, where he does where he does this analysis himself. And he's he's a PhD student in religious studies, and he has the same kind of attitude. Like I, I mean, it could go either way. Like it, it, the evidence fits. Uh, it looks to me like the evidence fits both hypotheses, and I just can't decide between them. Yeah. So with these like uh, possible Pauline. Um, references to you know something earthly about jesus um is there scholarship that argues for um the interpretation that supports like a celestial interpretation that are independent of the myth mythicism thesis uh, in most cases, no. My book is the first to introduce this into the peer-reviewed literature, to actually get through peer review. Uh, Earl Doherty actually articulated a really good thesis of it before, but he didn't he didn't put it through peer review. Uh, and so I, I, and that's the thing that I thought like he, that needs to get into peer review. And so that's that's actually one of the functions of my book uh, was to do that. And I think now it should be debated because we've got some of this in there. Mm. Um, there are aspects of it that exist in the in the literature. So for example, the argument that uh, that the um, that James, the the brother of the Lord James, that's in Galatians one, um, there is a there is a peer reviewed literature backstory on that where there have been scholars who who admit that what Paul is saying there is that that James was not an apostle, um, and so for them, of course, they're assuming well then uh, that's saying that the brothers of the Lord didn't become apostles and so on. Um, but there is there is actually peer reviewed literature backing that, and I cite all of that uh, in um, on the historicity of Jesus. So there there's some aspects of this that have uh, peer reviewed backstory to it, uh, but it's not a consensus position. But there are experts who yeah. would agree with pieces of it, and it's one of those things when you look at all the experts who agree with pieces of it and put them all together, you can kind of build all of it out. But uh, there isn't anybody who's actually put it all together like that. I'm I'm the first yeah. one to have done that. I'm yeah, the first I mean, one to have that under peer review. Earl it seems the like going to do it uh, otherwise. Yeah, it seems like there's some real good opportunity there to actually publish some of this stuff in you know smaller form mm -hmm. peer reviewed articles. Um, but in particular, there's two um, two words that a lot of interpretation seems to hinge on. One of them is the word for like made or, or to, oh, to make yeah. to divine mm -hmm. manufacture or mm -hmm. the alternate. Um, interpretation of it, which is something like born. Yeah, yeah. But I, I would love to read some published stuff on that because the problem for me is oh, that- like, There is what, stuff on that actually. Um, so ironically, Bart Ehrman uh, has written it. He covers this a little bit uh, in his book, uh, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Uh, and he's the one who talks about how, uh, and he doesn't go into it in as much detail as I would like. Uh, I think someone could do more on this uh, than has been done. But he points out that there were uh, scribes in, 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 in later editions of the Bible who were very disturbed by the fact that Paul used genomenos and not genao. Right. Uh, they were very well aware that genao for Paul meant literal human birth and that genomenos was a much more ambiguous and metaphysical statement. Uh, and that, in fact, there were Christian factions who were arguing that genomenos did not mean literal birth. 
Uh, and so that the Orthodox uh, group who, who did not like the fact that these heretics were using the words of Paul to undermine their, their own particular orthodoxy, tried to alter the text of Paul to change those words, but in both places, very conspicuously, both in Romans 1, 3 and in Galatians uh, oh. 4, which the two places, the only two places where this, this is in contention. Did they uh, change they it? They tried to convert it to Gnao. To the appropriate case uh, of, or the appropriate con conjugation of Ganao. Did, did um, they change it in the case, uh, like, did they corrupt it in the case that where it refers to Adam and Adam's body? No. They didn't. They left they did that not. one. Correct. Okay, that's interesting. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, because he certainly wasn't born, right? That's, so. that's the thing. Yeah. And that's exactly what these other Christian factions were arguing. It's like, hey, Paul uses the same word here he uses of not only Adam. Who was not literally born but also our future resurrection bodies which are not born they don't come out of a vagina of a woman right so uh they're manufactured by god and so so here paul's choosing this word that he uses for the manufacture of the body of adam and for the manufacture of future bodies which god has already made for us they're sitting like android bodies like a heaven's gate cult would think uh they're sitting waiting for us up in heaven for us to jump into them like escape pods um and that's in 1 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 5, uh, for anyone who doesn't believe me, uh, that's what Paul says. Uh, so, um, yes, that's what's very peculiar about it, is that he deliberately avoids the word that he always uses for human birth and uses this word that he uses for divine manufacture in both those places. Uh, and, and that's that's the uh, the crux that, that, that creates the ambiguity. Like, now we're like, well, shit, what did he mean then? Uh, mm. and, and, it, and it's the... If you step back and look at it, so as a way to look at it is like you're, you're des like apologists are desperately looking for any verse they can hang historicity on. And so just trying to cherry pick anything that they can hang it on. But if you step back and ask, okay, if Jesus existed, what would we expect Paul to have written? Now you get a different take on it because Paul would certainly have written tons of different things. Um, not only he himself would have written different things about how his own take on Jesus and stuff like that, but his enemies would be shouting things back at him about the historical Jesus that he would have to answer. So he would have to like rebut a lot of arguments from these, you know, well, I was there or so-and-so said he was there and Jesus said this other thing. And I, you know, um, but Paul never has to deal with that argument. And, and so Paul says these weird things. All he says are weird. Every, everything he says about Jesus is weird. And there, there's nothing in uh, Paul's letters, the authentic letters that Paul says about Jesus uh, that isn't weird. Uh, from the perspective of assuming that Jesus was a historical person. And that in and of itself is weird. Uh, and that, that's why we have this problem, uh, you know, and me in particular in terms of, uh, but others who have come to the same conclusion, um, that I think what's happened is that people have gotten rid of the really explicit uh, celestial Jesus stuff from Paul. They've cobbled together the pieces of Paul that they can sort of plausibly pass off in defense of their particular historical version of Jesus. And that's the version of Paul we get to read so that we only see these clues of this previous version of these letters uh, that we don't, we don't really know what was really all the complete corpus of Paul. We don't get to read it. We only get to read these selections that, that have been edited together by these historicists who want to push a historical Jesus. And then even that, when they put that together, realize that there were other Christians who were using it against them to argue for a mythical or celestial Jesus. And so they, then they started doctoring the manuscripts and Bart Ehrman writes about that in Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Okay, Rick, we've entered the speed round of the of, All right. of the show. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I want to give the, the people who subscribe to my channel a chance to ask questions. So I've compiled a list here. There's like 15 to 20 of them. So mm -hmm. we've got to be very, very brief. Some of them, sure. we, we've already, some of them we already uh, answered. Uh, Mike Winger is a guy I interviewed twice. And he is just, I think, a little bit puzzled why people like Tacitus do, do not provide good evidence for the historicity of Jesus. And we already answered that. It's basically hearsay, correct? Yeah, and uh, you got to remember that Tacitus is very contemptuous of uh, superstitious people. He's, he's content if Tacitus wrote about Christians, so we're just going to assume for the sake of this that that's what he actually wrote. Um, he held them in such contempt that he he thought that, that if he had been, been told that story that he reports that, that we have in the manuscripts now, he would have found that so ridiculous and embarrassing that he would have just repeated it. He wouldn't have fact checked it because he would say like, why do we even have fact check this? this? This is great. This is like ridiculous. Um, this makes them look bad as it is. So, so for him, 
he wouldn't fact check it, but he, he really couldn't either because the any records that would have been had burned down twice or three times right. since. Uh, so there wasn't any way for him to do that. But he, he wouldn't have wasted time in, in the library fact checking that. He, he would have found it just just precious, the story that was being told him. Now, I don't think Tacitus actually wrote about Christians. I think he was writing about a different Jewish rebel group, um, and then it got distorted over time, uh, interpolated with the line. But that people can read about that uh, in Hitler, Homer, Bible Christ, which has my uh, journal article on that subject. Okay. Um, I've been quoted as saying that atheists are freaks of nature. Do you agree? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Um, it's still, I, I, I'm bugged by the fact that it is a recent modern Western invention to make the dichotomy atheist versus theist. Yeah. Um, because in reality, it's it's supernaturalist versus naturalist. It's, being a naturalist is a freak of nature. But this is the reason why um, I, the reason why I bring this up: uh, atheists being freaks of nature. Because my cousin Leon, from he, he lives in Islamabad and he's around Islam a lot, but he's mm -hmm. reading the book *Sapiens* right now, and he's saying, "Look, it's pretty clear through evolution that it's these shared myths that kind of build community." What would happen to the world if everyone took your view about the biggest religion in the world? Would we lose community? No, people just invent new myths. We have so <laughs> many. We have so many. I mean, I mean, Marxism is a whole mythology. Um, you have uh, even in America, you have conservative and liberal yeah. political ideologies are built on mountains of mythology. Um, so mythology is not connected to the supernatural at all. You, you can build out mythology um, on anything. So we just shift from one myth uh, to another. Yeah, and, and then the question is, are these myths, if people start taking the myths literally, that's bad. And if they're taking them allegorically, now you, your, your standard for whether they're true or not is different. Um, and so you can still have false myths, even if they're taken allegorically, the allegory, the message about the world can still be wrong. Um, so I, th I think it's better to like, build off of like a scientifically informed mythology, uh, humanist mythology. And, and that's kind of what's happened in the 20th century. Um, and Flynn, who, who the, the Flynn effect in, in his explanation of the rises of IQs and stuff in the 20th century is based on this idea that our new mythology is fiction. So we have Star Trek, we have the Simpsons, we have, um, you know, we have Star Wars, we have these, these epics that we use for memes and concepts to understand the world and, and interpret our world, but we don't take them literally. We know they're fiction, but and, oh, Harry Potter is a new one, right? So, so Harry Potter gets you. So, like the you the idea of muggles versus you know wizards, right? Like that will get allegorized into real world situations a lot. Um, so we're doing that all the time, but now we're we're conscious enough that the myths we're using, we know they're literally false. And that we're using them as allegories, and that, that that's a step forward. Okay. Um, so that, that that's the future for mythology in terms of building community. And the secret to that, though, is that we all need to we need to know the myths so that we can speak the same language. So, um, and we haven't really settled on a new set of classics. There was kind of agreement on what the classics were. It was like Shakespeare and these other the, the canon, right, of the of the literature that you're supposed to know. That's gone by the wayside. And now we have subcultures that, you know, there are people who are really, who know Harry Potter or who know Star Wars or who know Star Trek or whatever it is that their thing is. And you have Christian communities that are trying to still work off of these, uh, their Christian literature. They've got, um, you know, the Left Behind series. This is like a new form of mythology that they're working on. Um, well, there's got, no consensus I got to get on, on to the next, I got to get on to the yeah. next one. Alex Buka from Australia asks, are you trying to convince people of the assertion that Jesus' character never existed, or are you trying to just cast doubt on the acceptance of the fact that he did exist in some shape or form? I'm happy with either outcome. I, so the way I see it is I myself am convinced that at best it's one in three chance he existed, um, which is still a pretty high probability, by the way. That's right. um, – People, you know, uh, overestimate. This is the fear of ambiguity. No one wants to like, uh, like deal. It's either he existed or he didn't. What, what's this one and three thing? Um, now, I think my own estimate is, you know, my my own personal convictions. It's probably one in twelve thousand. But even one in twelve thousand is not as low a probability as people think. Um, but I think, you know, accounting for my biases, it's somewhere in between those. 
Uh, and, but that's my own personal conviction based on my looking at the evidence. I think at the very least, looking at the evidence objectively, everybody should be an agnostic about historicity. Uh, you know, so I, I don't expect them to agree with me on the lower bound. I don't even expect them to agree with me on the upper bound. Maybe they'll end up at 50%. But I think, I think there should be doubt. I think doubt should be more universal. Doubt is a virtue. Is. Name of my channel. Okay, uh, Jason, Tre <laughs> Jason Trepins asks, and I, I want you to try to answer this one in one sentence. What is the top point against your position on the historicity of Jesus from your um, uh, criticizers? What is the yeah, best argument against you? The brother of the Lord, okay, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Right. Um, that, I think, is the final linchpin of the case. I think it, once that domino falls, uh, it's the last domino that falls for you in, in terms of where you are on historicity. So I think that's where the best argument for historicity is, is to try and really defend the brother of the Lord James thing as being a, a reference to a biological kinship, not a, a, right. a cultic kinship. Um, that, that, that's the best, that's the best they have. Yeah. Atheist Normal C asks, oh, he doesn't ask anything. He actually just wants to thank you for your service in the Coast Guard and that he's been in the Coast Guard 16 years himself. And he's a big Oh, fan. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would do it again. I learned more in my two years in the Coast Guard uh, than in any other 10 years of my life. So, yeah. Uh, you don't have to answer this one, but Wooden Stuff, Steve French asked about, what's the obsession with foreskins in the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, I don't know that one uh, because the obsession predates Judaism. It's actually an Egyptian thing. Okay. Uh, circumcision was an Egyptian practice, and it gets borrowed by the Jews. And and the, the hypothesis, I think, is that they borrow it to distinguish themselves from other Canaanites in the region. And that's where it starts. It, it's a cultural thing. It's a way to distinguish insiders from outsiders. Um, but uh, I don't know a whole lot. I haven't studied the whole history of circumcision to know exactly what the leading consensus is on that. Well, my parents were fundamental Christians, and but I still have my foreskin. Thank you very much. Uh, Travis Statham. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I want you to answer this one on a scale of one to ten. Ten meaning you love, love, love him, and zero meaning you hate, hate, hate him. <laughs> Travis wants to know, what is your opinion on Joseph Atwill and Caesar's Messiah? So you're not Tin foil hat. So you're down to one <laughs> okay, or zero. <laughs> no, I, I don't hate him. I, I think, no, no, not I the person, but but the the, 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 yeah, yeah. the theory. I, I think he's genuinely insane. Like, uh, so I, I actually have sympathy uh, for him. But um, no, it's no. <laughs> okay. Tim Hearn. No, it's, it's crank. It's definitely crank. Uh, Tim Hem asks, "Can you, in one sentence, define supernatural?" Yes. Um, so the supernatural is the irreducibly mental. So uh, that that's one sentence. But if you want to, <laughs> you would probably go, what the hell does that mean? Uh, I have articles on it uh, on my old blog. So um, also, I talk about it in my book, Sense and Goodness Without God. Uh, and I have, I've written on it uh, for Free Inquiry and some other publications. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, if everything that exists, even mental things, thoughts, and so on, can be reduced to non-mental things, in other words, they're produced by non-mental things, mechanisms, machinery, and so on, biology and whatnot, um, then there is nothing supernatural. But anything that is actually genuinely supernatural is going to be somehow non, it's going to be some mental property that cannot reduce to a non-mental property. And that's, uh, and, and I have a variety of articles I've written where I show that this is actually what people mean by supernatural when they're talking about it. Um, on my old blog, uh, you can find, you can probably just Google Richard Carrier defining the supernatural and you'll find your way. Uh, and I give men multiple examples of the difference between natural explanations for things and supernatural explanations and what actually differs between them. Um, in one article, I even have an, a little brief anthropology where I analyze people's statements and show that that's actually what they're talking about and so on. So people who are interested in that, uh, can pursue it there. Wonderful. There just wants to make the point that a lot of Christians believe because of faith, not that they can prove it. And I think you and I would agree. Uh, yes. Um, but what I would say to that wonderfuller is that, you know, you can believe anything on faith. And um, if you value truth, uh -huh. shouldn't you believe things that are true as much as possible? So if, yeah. fa if faith is not a reliable method to come to knowledge, then I think we should maybe not value it so much. Talt That's right. Talt um, no, talk to me about life. 
Uh, we already answered his question. The Prop King. I'm a huge fan of his, and I'm dying to ask this question. From what I've read from archaeological, <laughs> archaeologic, archaeological lists, gists, Bethlehem nor Nazareth didn't exist. True or false? Before uh, mm. Jesus. Problematic. I would, I would answer that unknown. Unknown, okay. Um, it's difficult to prove something didn't exist. Uh, there are a lot of problems with that, especially yeah. when there's modern human shit sitting on top of it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's there are a lot of bad arguments for the non-existence of Nazareth, um, a lot of crank arguments for the non-existence of Nazareth. Um, I, I think the existence of Nazareth makes more sense than the non-existence of Nazareth. Um, but I don't, I, I don't assume that there's some sort of slam dunk evidence that proves that Nazareth was a thing in the 30s AD or the, you know, turn of the common era. Um, and I don't think it matters whether Bethlehem or Nazareth existed. I don't believe that even if Jesus was a historical person, I don't believe he visited either place or ever lived either place. Um, so, and that's even if he existed as a historical person, uh, his association with those two cities is completely made up and it's completely based on scripture. Both of them are based on scripture. Matthew himself specifically says the Nazarene concept, he gets the idea of attaching Jesus to Nazareth comes from scripture. Uh, and a mis mistranslation and misunderstanding of scripture at that. Um, so so the, the existence or non-existence of Nazareth or Bethlehem are not useful data points for the historicity of Jesus. Okay. Uh, Jared McComb, we already answered your question. Oh, I, actually, he asked about um, your thoughts on the price versus Airman uh, debate, but you've, you've wrote extensively on your blog about that, correct? Yeah, yeah. If he wants to know my thoughts on that, they're on there, yeah. <laughs> RichardCarrier.info. Uh, once you get to my blog at RichardCarrier.info, there's a search engine. You can do Airman Price Debate, and you'll get the you'll get the article. Stout asked about the evidence and sources for the deaths of the disciples. Uh, well, it's not really in the Bible, is it? It's uh, traditions. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, they uh, that's one where I have a whole article on that too. Uh, did the apostles die for a lie? is the name of my article I wrote on, on my blog a few months ago. Um, so if you Google Richard Carrier and did the apostles die for a lie, you'll probably find it. Or you can go to my blog, richardcarrier.info, search for in, on the search engine, apostles die, and you'll probably get the article on that, where I, I talk about that in detail. Yeah. My Open Mind and Joe Cortenhoven, we've answered your questions already. Um, Viva Hernando, we answered your question about the when was the Book of Daniel written. Uh, 23 Yuvas, um, ask him how it's possible that Stephen Unwin came to the conclusion that God exists using Bayes' theorem. Well, that might be something you can't answer in a short time. Yeah. Maybe someday you'll have me back on on that one. Yeah. Um, I have a lot to say about that, actually. Um, I mean, the short answer is garbage in, garbage out. Uh, the answer to that is the exact same answer you would give to how William Lane Craig can use standard syllogistic logic to prove that God created the universe. Um, the premises suck. That's, <laughs> uh, that's the answer to that. Um, yeah. So yeah, he, he just imports ridiculous probabilities that are uninformed and absurd. Okay. Well, that's two hours. We didn't get all the questions in, uh, but we got most of them. Um, so we, even though I didn't acknowledge cool. uh, people who asked the question, we answered it, I think during the course of the two hours. Well, this has been intense and fun. Um, yeah. I learned a lot. There's some things I didn't know. Uh, Cam is, I think, very happy that you came on because he, he besides you, he, he is the next atheist who knows the most about the Bible that I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Nice. But um, thanks to everyone. We had like 60 or 70 people. Do you want to plug your website one more time and your books or whatever you want to do? Yeah, actually everything you can find at richardcarrier.info. Um, I teach online courses every month, uh, very affordable for people who want to learn about philosophy and ancient history. Um, I have multiple books in all formats, electronic, audio, print, uh, and then I blog regularly and i um, always happy to have new patrons supporting uh, my blogging and so forth. So yeah, check out all things Richard Carrier at richardcarrier.info. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks for hanging out and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Rick.